good afternoon. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 2281 in the name of Fergus Ewing on realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now? Point of order, Mr Mountain. In the portfolio questions prior to the First Minister's questions today, the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, said that he thought the Conservative Party suffered from schizophrenia. I think that is discourteous under Rule Section 7.3.1 of the Standing Orders, and I also think it trivialised the serious mental health issues in, in the world. And I would like to ask the presiding officer if she would give Mr Ewing the chance to withdraw that comment. Can I first of all thank the member for advance notice of his point of order. The member in the chamber will be aware that a similar point of order was raised today at First Minister's questions. And I would say that what the presiding officer there I concur with is that all members should treat each other with courtesy and respect in the language within this chamber wherever they are. I now call on Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary, to move and uh, the motion and speak. 12 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, I was immensely honoured to win the Politics and Business Award last week, but I will also admit to a twinge of envy at Joanne Lamont winning e-politician of the year for her erudite and witty engagement on social media. Because I am struck on a daily basis, uh, even in my own household, of the generational divide which exists in the digital world. It is a space that I and many others in this chamber have learned to inhabit. We are digital adaptives, whilst children like my eight-year-old daughter are absolutely digital natives. And it is for our children that we must ensure that Scotland and indeed future generations can realise their full potential in a digital world. We must equip our nation with the skills and attitudes to seize new opportunities and participate in this world. We must acknowledge that digital has fundamentally changed how we live our lives, access information, learn, communicate and do business and seek to develop that. And we must have the right climate for business. We must drive economic growth. The digital strategy published by this government in 2011 has served as well. But we must now develop a programme of action, action on connectivity, digital economy, skills, participation, security and transforming our public services. My cabinet colleague Derek Mackay has overall responsibility for this area and he will address this and our vision in more detail. But first I make clear that if we are to uh, succeed, we must be open to all ideas, knowledge and experience, and indeed we are. And perhaps as proof of that, presiding officer, I am pleased to confirm that the Scottish Government will be accepting both amendments from uh, the uh, Labour and Conservative parties today. Although, in so doing, I would point out that I think that the reference to G5 in the Labour's amendment should be to 5G. I think G5 does relate with respect to something else or, or some, somewhere else <laughs> all together. Uh, but, uh, be that as it may, I, I hope that we will have a, a constructive debate today and I'm certainly willing to listen to what every member has to say, irrespective of party politics. We have a strong foundation on which to build. Our investment in the Digital Scotland Superfast uh, programme, DSSB, is paying off. The total programme investment, presiding officer, is £410 million. We are on track to deliver fibre access to at least 95% of premises in Scotland by the end of 2017. Presenting officer, I'm delighted to announce that an additional 660,000 premises across Scotland now have access to fibre as a result of our programme. Uh, higher than expected uptake of services means that we are reinvesting in the programme uh, to push coverage even further. Moreover, our achievements and progress are being recognised externally. Audit Scotland recently reported that deployment of fibre broadband through DSSB is progressing well. Audit Scotland said that we have a higher than anticipated number of premises capable of accessing super fast speeds. And just on Monday this week, whilst attending the Convention of the Highlands and Islands, Ofcom, uh, who participated and took part in this proceedings, highlighted that super fast broadband coverage in Scotland 
has increased by 14% in the last 12 months. Ofcom said that that is the largest increase in the UK. Around 2.1 million consumers and small businesses are now able to access super fast services and there have been improvements in both urban and rural areas. Ofcom's figures show that mobile service has improved too. Voice calls are now possible at 92% of all premises in Scotland, up from 90% in 2015, and 3G coverage has increased from 79 to 86%. Coverage of high-speed data services has also increased significantly. 58% of all premises can now receive a 4G signal outdoors. However, we are not, we are not complacent. We know there is much more to do. As Ofcom highlighted, there is still considerable disparity in mobile coverage between urban and rural areas. As Audit Scotland noted, meeting our commitments on broadband coverage, particularly in remote areas, will be challenging. And while the figures and facts depict a positive picture, this does not always translate into the actual experience of people and businesses. I'm acutely aware of this disconnect and I'm determined to address it. Now, presiding officer, we are purposively ambitious in this area. Our 100% superfast broadband commitment far outstrips the UK government's plans, which are limited to a universal service obligation at just 10 megabits per second. Whilst we welcome the contribution from the UK government to help meet the shared commitment of achieving 95% by 2017, our progress would not have been possible without joint investment from the Scottish Block Grant. Without that funding, across Scotland, commercial deployment would have delivered only 66% fibre broadband coverage, with as little as 21% coverage across the Highlands, and no commercial coverage at all in Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. Work is already underway to prepare for delivery of 100% superfast access by 2021. We have published a prior information notice to provide potential suppliers with information on the superfast broadband access commitment. This is a necessary precursor to commencing procurement early next year. Before then, we will finalise the coverage footprint to be delivered by the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme to complete the commitment to deliver fibre broadband access to at least 95% of premises in Scotland. We will also undertake an open market review, formally consulting with telecom suppliers to determine commercial investment plans. We are absolutely committed to working with industry, especially to improve mobile coverage across Scotland, and recently published the only mobile action plan in the UK with the four UK operators. We are learning lessons from the UK government's failed mobile infrastructure project, presenting also only three out of its planned 84 masts for Scotland were delivered. So we're taking a different approach to deliver the best possible result for Scotland, working with industry to develop a mobile infill programme. We are actively supporting the development of new technologies alongside industry and higher education as part of our world-class programme to extend connectivity to rural areas and establish Scotland as a test bed for innovation. Our work with industry is key. Government and public investment alone cannot, should not, and will not deliver the infrastructure that we all wish. There is a role for, and indeed a responsibility on, private sector providers to support delivery of our ambitions. Whilst the UK government has primary responsibility and powers over mobile uh, connectivity, reserved matters, presiding officer, we are, so far as we can, getting on with what we need to do to realise our ambitions. I am, however, greatly encouraged by Sharon White, the Chief Executive of Ofcom, by Sharon White's work with us to find solutions. Uh, Sharon has already made a substantial effort to enhance Ofcom's presence in Scotland, with her office in Edinburgh, and she personally has visited a number of remote areas of the country to aid her understanding of the key connectivity issues. Uh, and I found her her interest in Scotland and her determination to work with us extremely positive and most welcome. Of course, the outcome of the EU referendum has created more unwelcome uncertainty as in all other policy and funding areas. But I will continue to press for clarity. 
clarity on whether Scotland will be able to benefit from the EU's recently announced Wi-Fi 4EU programme, which aims to extend access to, wi to free Wi-Fi in public places. Clarity on what happens to funding beyond March 2019. And that's the 120 million euros associated with the EU's Wi-Fi programme, or the 941 million euros planned investment across the 2014 to 2020 EU funding programmes. And lastly, clarity on whether Scots will be able to benefit uh, from the deal on roaming charges when they travel abroad uh, that is due to come into effect next year. Planning officer, in conclusion, uh, realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world is crucial to our ambitions to become a fairer, more inclusive and more prosperous economy. Achieving our commitment to deliver 100% superfast broadband to all premises by 2021 is fundamental to this and will require us all to put our shoulder to the wheel. We are open to ideas. We are open to positive contributions to create a shared vision. It's in all our interests to ensure that Scotland can indeed realise its full potential in a digital world because, as Bill Gates once astutely observed, the internet is becoming the town square for the global village of tomorrow. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call Jamie Green to speak to and move Amendment 2281.2. Uh, generous seven minutes, Mr Green. Seven. Sorry, were you expecting? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it was nine. Sorry, but that's fine. Well, you can take nine. I have some time in hand <laughs> if you wish. I won't. I'll try not to. I'll try not to. Don't tempt me. Uh, presiding officer, uh, it is a great... Uh, first of all, uh, G5 is the brand new uh, handset just out from a certain mobile operator. I think it came out last week, so uh, it's very topical. Thank Labour for bringing that up. It is a great pleasure to open this debate as the Conservative spokesman for technology, connectivity and the digital economy, but also as a member of the cross-party group on digital participation. Uh, I also refer members to my register of interests. Uh, today I want to set out uh, my vision on digital Scotland uh, and to demonstrate the importance of universal digital participation for realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world. Now here in this chamber we often debate this subject in terms of connectivity and digital infrastructure by looking at targets and percentages. But when considering digital participation, it is important to look behind the numbers. And let me expand on this. I'm sure every member in this chamber receives many letters and emails from constituents who struggle to access high-speed internet or sometimes any speed internet. And it's not just in rural areas, it's also in our towns and cities. And I think we'll hear many examples of this today. My tuppence worth on this is from somebody who lives just a few miles away from this chamber who can't access high-speed internet because he lives on the wrong side of the street. Where I live in North Ayrshire, as I mentioned in my maiden speech in this place, that I still achieve speeds of one and a half uh, meg, which is speeds of years ago. It is important to acknowledge that the Royal Society of Edinburgh pointed out in their 2014 digital participation report that whilst investment has been forthcoming and welcome and targets are all well and good, these numerical targets still leave the door open for existing inequalities to go unaddressed. These inequalities include a lack of affordable internet, uh, a lack of devices to make use of that internet, and a basic lack of digital skills to use either of those tools. Now for those on low incomes, for example, buying a tablet or paying a high monthly fee for broadband is not always an option. Therefore, your digital participation is already restricted, regardless of whether broadband is available or not. If you live in a city, but have no 4G coverage in your area, your digital participation is restricted. If your children attend a school where there is no computing teacher, their future digital participation is already restricted. And those restrictions create inequality. It holds us back from what the great online has to offer, namely making the day-to-day -day cheaper, faster and easier. I'd like to look at one example of this, healthcare, where those inequalities are most prevalent in Scotland. In one community, you might be able to make a GP appointment or see your medical records or order repeat prescriptions. 
online. Drive a few miles down the road and the story is quite different. It's a phone call, it's a two week wait, and it's a piece of paper. Yet, in a small country like Belgium, you can use the same ID to access your healthcare as you can to download documents from your town hall. So whilst other countries are investing in e-health, in Scotland it's your postcode that determines whether you get your prescription by post or by email. I've seen how proper digital back offices work in other countries, in those countries where substantial investment in digitised records, single logins and user-friendly websites and apps lets the public access public services cheaply, faster and more easily. The NHS Education for Scotland's Director of Digital Transformation, Christopher Roth, pointed out just last month that our health services also face, also face challenges, in part down to the lack of ICT skills within the healthcare systems. In Scotland, three quarters of firms say that digital technologies are essential or important for their own plans for growth. Yet 30% of the Scottish population lack basic digital skills. Now, I think it's up to the public and private sectors to use digital innovation to connect every citizen to those services, but also promote businesses that contribute to the social and environmental well-being of our country. I shall. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, the member's making some interesting and uh, very valid points, uh, but will he accept that for Scotland and indeed countries around the world, there is a huge opportunity to develop new interfaces between the human users of technology and the technology itself. And that the real triumph for the computer will be when we no longer know that we're interacting with one. Mr. Green. Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> and therein lies the answer. Uh, that leads nicely into my next point, actually, which is about networks. Perhaps you could explain what he meant to the chair <laughs> here. I have no idea what that meant. I, I, I shall respond to the presiding officer in writing uh, to that <laughs> intervention. Um, <laughs> it makes a good point. Uh, networks aren't just physical things. Uh, I, I really believe that we should be building networks of people, human networks. And those are networks of digital innovators and entrepreneurs, designers, developers, content creators. For example, people working together to solve a problem, such as identifying and removing the barriers that women have in reaching leadership roles in STEM careers, for example. So what is at stake here? Well, according to Deloitte, if Scotland were to become a world leader in digital industries by 2030, it would see an increase of over 13 billion pounds in GDP. But if we continue as we are, we may only see an increase of four billion. So that's a nine billion pound loss to our economy over the next 15 years if we don't take immediate and visionary action. Now, perhaps something you may not see very often, from these benches especially, is a copy of the Daily Record. And this is an edition from the 1st of January, the year 2000. And in it are predictions such as bulky TV sets will now be replaced by flat screen technology. That never happened. If we're chilly, intelligent central heating systems will respond automatically. People will be able to order and pay for anything they want from their mobile phones. If you can get a signal. <laughs> Today, these predictions sound amusing to us, but 16 years ago, they were like predictions from tomorrow's world, like the Sinclair C5, only a bit more useful. <laughs> Progress has come much faster than we ever anticipated. My amendment today is important for two reasons. First, we must recognize the challenges facing us in achieving 100% high-speed broadband in this country. And therefore, we should be open-minded as to the technology mix that we might need to reach that last 5%. And some of my colleagues are going to go into this in more detail. But secondly, and more importantly, we must remember that the end result of all this is not simply hitting a target. Our ambition must be to achieve full digital participation in Scotland. I therefore appeal to the Scottish Government to be entirely more visionary, and I look forward to hearing more about their plans over the course of this debate. In conclusion, the reason for this is because we have a generation of Scots who have had mobile phones since they were five years of age. We have a generation of Scots facing automation in middle management jobs, where professional, creative, design and manufacturing services may be automated online or completely virtual. 
I don't want a Scotland that catches up with the digital economy. I want Scotland to lead it. I conclude with the final words of this paper's editorial from that first day of this new millennium. It said, the only limits to what mankind can achieve in our next 100 years, let alone the millennium, are the ones in our imagination. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We're most impressed you've kept such an old newspaper. Um, could I now call uh, Rhoda Grant uh, to speak to and move Amendment 2281.3? Seven minutes, if you wish, Ms Grant, and perhaps she'll tell us what G5 is at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I actually don't have a clue what G5 is, but I know what 5G is. <laughs> I, th I think it, it was a typo as much as anything else, so I apologise for that, but I'm sure... That won't stop the Chamber supporting our motion, which I think Chamber makes an awful lot of um, sense. Um, this, uh, presiding officer, the debate gives us the opportunity to feed our views and priorities into the refresh of the digital strategy. Um, there's no nothing in the motion and indeed the Conservatives' amendment that can be disagreed with. However, we need to make sure that we not only have an agreed vision, but that we are also in a position to make it a reality. The Scottish Government has to do better, and the Audit Scotland report makes that clear, uh, providing access to dig the digital economy in areas where the market has failed or is in, is, and progress is slow. We will continue to hold the Government uh, to account on their performance in that area, urging for a better and faster response. Everyone, regardless of where they live and what their income is, should have access to technology to allow them to access work and information. They should also be able to participate in social interaction that digitisation can bring, and indeed we take a lot of that for granted. Um, I, I would hate to point out that the presiding officer's phone has maybe oh, gone off. That's so unkind of you to mention that. that this she has so switched on digitally, I couldn't help it. Well, it happens to the best of us, and the best of us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, presiding officer, we have a digital divide, although you may not be part of it. Um, <laughs> um, in affluent urban areas, uh, the, mar the market has provided and continues to provide the infrastructure that we require. Our cities are quickly becoming digitised um, in business sectors and indeed the leafy suburbs with 4G and now 5G being rolled out, as well as dedicated city services and indeed free wi Wi-Fi in public places. Unfortunately, our rural areas and our deprived inner city areas are being left behind. And as more and more information and the provision of goods and services are digitised, those of us who don't have access are further disadvantaged. Benefits, job searches and the like are all on digital platforms. Those who don't have access have less chance of changing their law or indeed um, getting the benefits that they are entitled to. Lack of connectivity means that our farmers are getting up in the wee small hours of the morning, not to milk the cows, but to try and submit their cap forms eh, while nobody else is using that connection. At a time when we face depopulation in our islands and remote areas, eh, digital access ha has, has never been more important and indeed required. Our vision of a digital economy is one that breaks down barriers and makes us an inclusive society that leaves no one behind, regardless of where they live and what their income is. We agree with the Scottish Government um, that telecoms companies must play their part. They make huge profits from rolling out infrastructure in lucrative markets, and they must reinvest some of these profits into the areas where markets fail. We also believe there is a role for government where markets fail. Digital connectivity is necessary not only for the individual, but also for service delivery, not least in health and social care services. We need to make sure that what is provided by government is as good as that that is, pro as is provided by the market, and that it can be easily upgraded and those areas don't fall behind again in the near future as the technology changes. Technology is changing and we need to make sure all those installations are future-proofed. New technologies are being developed. Um, last week I learned of Li-Fi, um, which can provide solutions in hard-to-reach areas as well as making others even more connected. I, I find it hard to imagine that every light bulb would act as a digital router. 
We have seen in deprived urban areas, the infrastructure is as poor as that in rural areas because the communications companies don't believe that the people living there will be able to afford to buy their services. However, even having the infrastructure at your very doorstep can mean you don't have access. We must find ways of enabling everyone in our society to have access to digital technology, to access health and social care services, but to also introduce them to economic opportunities. Connectivity comes at a cost. You need money to buy a computer. You need money to pay for the broadband connection. When you're struggling to keep the roof over your head and the food on the table, connectivity is not always your top priority. And I visited CAB in WIC some time ago now, and they had recognised that as a problem. They had a room set up with second-hand computers that they'd been able to get their hands on, and that allowed their clients to come in and access the internet for job searches and benefits. And that's helpful, but the technology moves on. All of us expect to be online all the time, and the service provision is built in around that level of connectivity. Therefore, those of us who don't have connectivity of that level are left behind. Presiding officer, I believe we're in the middle of a second enlightenment, an age where the future is digital, from reading a book to having your health monitored. The internet of things is growing where information is at your fingertips. Do you know how warm your house is before you get there? And indeed, you can turn up the heating. Um, the opportunities available are only limited by our own imaginations. And yet, knowledge and skills about our digital world are limited. We need schools to teach this as part of their very basic education, from the youngest primary school child to those leaving with advanced qualifications. It needs to be taught as part of every subject in our colleges and universities and part of lifelong learning and continuous professional development in the workplace. The speed of change is rapid. We need to make sure our workforce keeps up to date. We need complex programming skills, but we also have to understand the technology. A farmer who can tell immediately, not from looking at their field, but looking at their computer screen, which of their animals needs their attention. There is no area or line of work that won't need these skills in the future, and we need to make sure we have them. Presiding officer, our amendment seeks to highlight the urgency required with progress and the need to sweep away the digital divide. We offer these as positive contributions. However, we're also extremely concerned at the speed of progress. Other small countries are way ahead of us, and we must catch up and get ahead. Being more connected with, would provide us with work and life opportunities that we can only guess at but to be left behind would be catastrophic. Therefore, we will support the government to provide di a digital infrastructure that's world leading, but we will also hold them to account should they fail. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Ms Grant. And I now move to the open debate. I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Edward Mountain. Mr Coffey, please. Thanks very much, President Officer. If I learned anything when I did my computer science degree at Strathclyde University in the late 1970s, it was that digital technology, we shouldn't expect anything to stay the same for very long. I started that course only seven years after the Americans had landed in the moon. And the technology and computing power to get them there is a tiny fraction of the computing power that we have now, even in mobile phones like, like this. The point of this is that there will never be a time when technological developments will slow down and we can stand back and admire our achievements. The challenge for us is how do we organise things, not just to embrace the technology of today, but to prepare the ground and open the doors for the rapid progression to what lies ahead in the future. What's certain is that we need the digital infrastructure or the super highway, as we used to call it. We need all of our population to be able to access it and to be engaged by the wonders and the possibilities of it all. And we need to create the potential for growth and attract the type of people who can imagine what that future could look like and to start building it. Software developers, principally. These are also the key drivers behind the European Digital Single Market Strategy, which I'll mention in a moment or two. Now, I can see all of these elements in the work that the Scottish Government is doing, and the potential is there to open those doors to that future. Firstly, we're currently engaged in delivering the infrastructure to 100% of our homes and businesses over the next five years. A huge task to achieve that in a country like Scotland. Secondly, we are working towards broadening access to digital technologies to all sections of our community, 
We have to make sure that no one or no section of our society is excluded. And thirdly, we are creating the opportunities for our young people to excite them about the fantastic possibilities of a career in software design. A career that can take them anywhere in the world they want to work. There's also some good work being done to get more females into technology and initiatives like Code Clan and the Digital Skills Academy and various coding clubs are perfect for nurturing this new talent that we will need. None of this is easy and there will be no end points even if we think we've made good progress. But these interventions are essential if we are to deliver that better digital world. As the great Alan Turing, the father of computer science, said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. If we embrace that view as we plan our digital future, then I think we won't go far wrong. President officer, if we look around Europe at the moment, we'll see that we're short of about 600,000 ICT personnel right now. And by 2020, this could be just under 1 million. So the success of the digital single market strategy in Europe is absolutely crucial if we're to develop and expand the economy, estimated to be worth over 400 billion euros in additional growth. If we look specifically at the digital market, only 4% of online services are done cross-border amongst the European countries, compared to about 42% within each country's jurisdiction. That's why the three aims in the digital single market strategy of better access, getting the right environment, and creating the potential for growth are crucial, not just for Europe, but for Scotland too. If we make e-commerce easier and with no tariff barriers, it will simplify copyright so that people can buy and develop content much easier across Europe. The digital single market, as you might expect, will be a key driver for economic growth here in Scotland. And it will be interesting to see whether the UK government plans to walk away from this when it departs the European Union or whether it wants to be part of it, as I think it must do. President officer, as convener of the cross-party group in digital participation, it's clear to all of our colleagues who attend that technology can be the greatest tool we have to help us deliver social justice. And I'm grateful to the Carnegie Trust for their briefing and for their support in the cross-party group. Social justice or inclusion or access doesn't happen by default, I'm afraid. It gets worse by default unless you do something about it. And digital exclusion also gets worse unless you do something about it. It's no surprise that the groups in society who are most excluded are usually the elderly, the unemployed, and people living in poverty. The Scottish government's digital participation programme with nearly two million pounds allocated to it will help those who would benefit most from being online, particularly our most vulnerable citizens. And the work being done with the voluntary sector and housing associations should also help us to peg that digital divide. Presiding officer, I think the Scottish Government's approach to all these matters is the correct approach. They mirror and enhance what Europe is also trying to achieve. It's ambitious and forward thinking and should help Scotland to make that step change towards realising our potential in the digital world that we live in. In that digital world, we will no doubt continue to see only those short distances ahead of us that Alan Turing referred to. But as long as we are willing to accept that and the new challenges that we will have to overcome, then I think that our digital future will be even more exciting than the one we live in today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Coffey. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr. Mountain, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I don't think there's a single MSP who represents a rural, regional constituency who didn't campaign during the election on the ticket of sorting out the lack of broadband and mobile connectivity in the area. What we said and what we published in our election literature will undoubtedly be quoted back to us and waved in our faces at the next election if we fail. I therefore welcome the government and the fact that they've made a commitment to superfast broadband and deliver it by 2021. I do, however, believe it will be a real challenge and an ambitious promise. And we've put it on record that we're happy to work with the government to achieve this, 
but we would also put on record that should they not deliver it or be doing enough to deliver it, then we will become their fiercest critic. Scotland as a whole has the lowest proportion of premises with access to fibre broadband in the UK. And the S Highlands and Islands ha is the lowest of all of Scotland, with only 79% of premises having access to fibre broadband. 26% of properties in the Highlands have broadband speeds of less than 10 megabytes. But it is these premises that will prove to be the most difficult places to deliver superfast broadband to, and it is perhaps these fragile rural areas that most need the broadband. Why? Well, we yes, I, Mr. I'm happy to give way on that. Good one. Like you, I contributed in my own material in the election and my leaflet is put around our broadband, but if you're prepared to be critical and help this, the Scottish Government on this issue, you're also prepared to be critical of the UK Government if we can't get there, given that actually telephony is still a reserve matter. Mr Mountain. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure the member would like to listen to the rest of my uh, uh, suggested uh, remedies before you, before you ask uh, whether I should be removing the plank out of other people's eye before we've removed the plank out of our own. So, of the 26% of properties that have broadband with less than 10 megabytes, as I said, these are the ones that will be the most difficult to produce superfast broadband to. And I was explaining why, in these rural areas, why we, they need to have it. Allowing these residents to contribute uh, to the economy and for their children to use the internet for learning is not just vital, it's an imperative. So, let's be clear, the digital divide in Scotland is massive and the Highlands are without doubt at the bottom of the league. So on the basis of delivering broadband to the last 5% of homes in Scotland, who will not have access to the fibre broadband, one has to ask how we will ensure that they get what has been promised to them. I would support calls at the outset now for BT, who will be the main suppliers in these areas, to outline the exact areas they cannot reach by 2021. Then we can see where the problems are. We then have to accept that the costs of delivering fibre to these super remote properties and houses will only increase. We heard the other day that this is... No, I, I'm, I'm afraid I, I'd like to crack on, having You're already taken one. You've plenty of time one. if you wish to. It's up to the member. Uh, I, I actually have heard uh, uh, one or two things from, from the member on broadband at committee meetings, so I'd like to push on with this. And I'm sure I'm going to hear more. Um, so, I heard the other day that the price and the cost for delivering to these houses is costing at the moment over £3,000 in some cases per house. And as we get to the last 2% of these super remote houses, the cost actually of delivering fibre could be well in excess of £50,000, which just makes it unjustifiable. So, we have to look at other options. And some of these areas that might benefit from is the community broadband an initiative that's been led by Highlands and Island Enterprise. Now, most of these projects are based on radio connection and nearest cable. There are other options, but these are limited by the final connection to the Cabinet. Now, we as a party support community broadband, and we believe that it needs an increase in funding, but we'd like to see that the support that community broadband gives Scotland is increased from, uh, from just communities to individuals and businesses. And we hope that the government agrees with us, and we'll wait to see that when they announce their budget. There are some other areas that we might have uh, ability to consider, and that's satellite. Now, but these have huge high startup costs. The Avanti pilot project with over 500 connections in Scotland offers speeds of 30 megabytes. But this concludes shortly. And again, if it's going to be used as part of the solution, then the government will need to consider increasing and extending funding. Those that have satellites will argue rightly, in my mind, that they have to pay increased costs. And if they are going to be, if satellites are going to be part of the final solution, then it is unfair that those people who have to rely on them have to bear the costs which are substantially more than those people who live in urban areas. So I believe if the government is going to rely on satellites to deliver their promise, they've got to be prepared to fund them and to make the running costs of them equitable to urban landlines. Now, I would like to offer some potential solutions that I would like the government to consider. They're all issues that could be addressed, and there will be issues in addressing them. But I would say whether there's a will, there's a way. 
Many hydro schemes operated in Scotland are run by central control rooms and use satellite connections. I can give you a perfect example at Dalnessy, at the top of the Brora, there is a satellite there, there is no connection to the telephone in the house next door to that site. Perhaps the government could consider working in this, uh, working with hydro to see if there is ways of connecting at that remote and the remote houses in the area. Many people will have seen masts next to bridges on railway lines. These up masts are owned by rail track and usually have fibre connection uh, to central control stations. There might be the possibility of connecting into these fibre cables and using them in remote areas to deliver broadband. Now, I suspect other utilities, and I know other utilities have fibre connections in remote areas, and we might be able to use these. Now, before I close, presiding officer, I'd just like to mention telecommunications. You have 30 seconds to mention it. It'll be quick. There are so many parts of the Highlands that are not covered by mobile communications, not spots. And for those in the rural areas, we would like to consider 4G. We have no G, and we certainly don't have G5, or whatever it is that the Labour are progressing. But we'd like to see that rolled out. So my message to the government, in conclusion, is that your promise is admirable, and we'd like to work with you in delivering it. But it can't be delivered on a postcode lottery with the last 5% of the difficult houses bearing an equitable cost to what is faced in urban areas. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. That's fine. That's good. Oh. Please sit down. Okay, thank yes. you, Mr. Uh, I now call Tom Arthur to be followed by Daniel Jones. Mr. Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as we meet here today, it can be uh, all too easy to take our digitised world for granted. It's uh, been over 40 years since Arthur C. Clarke stated that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. To an average citizen of, say, the 1960s, our digitally connected world of today would have been uh, scarcely imaginable and would have been deemed, if perhaps not the stuff of magic, certainly the stuff of science fiction. Now we are all the inhabitants of uh, Marshall McLuhan's global village. It's difficult to overstate the impact this has had upon our way of life. At no point in the history of our species has it been easier to acquire new knowledge. Goethe may have said that one who cannot draw in 3,000 years is living from hand to mouth, but today, via a smartphone, one can now access the entirety of human knowledge from hand to eye. Never has it been easier to trade from the streets of Mong Kok to the slopes of Montmartre from Tokyo's Akihabara to Glasgow's Barras, not one of those great districts rightly famed for their markets and street trade can compete in range and reach with the omnipresence of the World Wide Web and its vast array of shops and traders. The effects of digitalisation upon our civic life, our political process, our media and even our language, hashtag Scott Power 16, have been profound. It has, for instance, never been easier for people to contact and interact with their elected representatives and governing bodies. Online platforms have posed challenges for traditional print media and given opportunities to others. The results of this have been as complicated and unpredictable as any other aspect of life. As significant as the impact felt to date has been, the developments and advances in the digitalization of our life in the coming years and decades are likely to be monumental and potentially redefine our understanding of what it is to be human. However, before turning to these more speculative matters, I would like to put on the record my support for this government's approach to realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world. I applaud the ambition to deliver fibre optic broadband to 95% of Scottish premises by the end of next year, and the commitment to 100% by the end of this parliament. This is something that will be warmly welcomed by many of my constituents in Renfrewshire South, particularly in Howwood and Loch Linnoch, where there are too many who uh, currently are unable to enjoy the internet speeds available in other parts of my constituency. Equally welcome are the plans to work with industry on a mobile programme to address gaps in 4G coverage, of which, again, there are several in Renfrewshire South. With mobile connectivity now such, of su such importance in our lives, it is vital that coverage is as wide as possible. The government's vision for both superfast broadband and 4G is one which will contribute significantly towards achieving digital equality. 
However, digital equality requires more than equality of access. For Scotland to realise its full potential in a digital world, it is vital that digital literacy is enhanced. And I welcome the government's recognition of this in its motion, which refers to both skills and participation. Presiding officer, the realisation of the government's vision for Scotland's digital future will equip, will, will equip the country with the infrastructure, resources and skills that will allow Scotland to realise its digital potential. And realising that potential, however, is also vital that it is informed by the values of equity and equality. The digital revolution has been an enabler for the emergent gig economy or access economy. While this represents an important development, allowing individuals to monetize their existing assets and skills, it is also equally another manifestation of the economic instability experienced by the contemporary precariat generation. Scotland's digital future must be one that is inclusive, where the benefits are shared by all and not accrued to the privileged few. We must also be aware of the role that digitalization has in relation to automation and AI. Many professions, from paralegals to truck drivers, will be challenged in the coming decades by the introduction of machines which can perform tasks more efficiently and for less cost. While the government cannot be realistically expected to predicate policy in such inchoate technologies, it can take this opportunity to embed values and principles which will ensure that the human cost of the disruptive effects of continued and future digitalisation are minimalised and mitigated. Of similar importance are the areas of security and of data, its regulation and privacy. It has been said that when something online is free, you're not the customer, you're the product. Regardless of whether or not we are paying, data generated from our online activity has a huge number of applications, both positive and negative. As we move into the era of the Internet of Things, where even the use of household appliances will produce data capable of capture, it is vital that we are continually vigilant of any attempts by corporate interests to undermine citizens' rights to privacy and ensure that our frameworks and regulations keep a pace with technological developments. In closing, presiding officer, I think it is fair to say that there is broad agreement across this chamber that Scotland must realise and embrace its digital future. As Scotland re realises its digital potential stands to benefit significantly, both economically and crucially, socially. I commend the government in bringing this motion to Parliament and I look forward to both my constituents in Renfrewshire South and indeed communities across Scotland enjoying the benefits of greater connectivity and digitalisation. Thank you very much, Mr Arthur. Can I just remind members that once you've spoken, there's a protocol in this chamber that you remain for the two following speeches. You don't nip out immediately afterwards. I say this without looking at anybody in particular. I call now Daniel Johnson, followed by Patrick Harvey. Mr Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, I don't think I'm alone in thinking that human history is very much the history of technology. It's technology which has shaped both how we live and what we do, from the wheel to the printing press to the silicon chip. It's technology which has shaped the way that we live our lives and what we are able to do. And I don't think anywhere else in the world could that be more true than in Scotland. It was our steel, our ships and our railway locomotives that brought about the first wave of globalisation, allowing us to reach places that had not been possible to reach before. But we are also aware in this country about the profound impact that technology change can also bring when those self-same technologies become obsolete and when the people who uh, work in those industries find that their labour is no longer as efficient and is replaced by other parts, places in the world. So in this debate we have talked much about connectivity but I would ask the question of what are we connecting to? Now, I'm sure I'm not alone in regarding Stuart Stevenson as something of a visionary in this chamber, but I think his comments about the seamless interfaces and integrating the human mind are relevant because I think we have to understand that the change that technology will bring are profound. And indeed, I think Tom Arthur is absolutely right to raise automation because that is the next wave of technology, but it is also going to be different. It's uh, thought that as many as 36% of jobs in this country could be made obsolete by automation. And so while previous technological leaps have improved productivity, essentially making us able to do more things as individuals, 
The difference now is that automation threatens to replace us altogether. So we need to talk as much about digital obsolescence as we do about digital exclusion. And as we look towards renewing the government's strategy on technology, I think uh, an omission of how we deal with automation and how we cope as a workforce uh, would be remiss in the extreme. So let me spell out just some of the impacts automation will bring. Indeed, Tom Arthur again mentioned automated vehicles. Trucks cost something like £200,000. We have an ageing workforce in the haulage industry. So it doesn't take much of a leap to understand that there's a big driver and a huge benefit to having trucks which can drive continuously, 24 hours a day, greatly uh, increasing the return on that investment and improving the efficiency. And when you realise that 6% of the workforce work in transport and distribution, and then maybe it's as many as 10% when you include wholesale industries, you understand the impact that automated vehicles could bring. So while news reports might regard as, uh, automated vehicles with the, the, the punchline of, look, no hands, the reality is we might ser seriously be looking at a situation where it's, look, no jobs. But it's more than just the economy of things. Administrative jobs are also uh, 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 under threat from automation. The recent Deloitte report mentioned earlier in the debate highlighted that 88,000 public sector jobs could be lost in our public services. People who are administering and organising our vital services in our society. But if you think that somehow our analytical capabilities might save us, again in healthcare, cancer screening, uh, AI algorithms are already identifying cancers more effectively and efficiently than the human eye. And on identifying drug interactions that quite simply no physician can keep in their head. The legal industry too, AI is able to analyse documents for loopholes and are already being used to draft legal documentation. So while this is a, a problem that we have to take very seriously, we are starting from a good place. In this city alone, we have hundreds of high-tech startup companies employing thousands of people. But we need to take the steps now to make sure that we can take those thousands of jobs and turn them into hundreds of thousands of jobs. But we also have to recognise the issues that we face. And for all the warm words and seriousness with which we take STEM subjects, we need to recognise that since 2007, we've been losing two STEM teachers a year in Scotland. Likewise, we've seen a fall of 187 computer science teachers. So we need to urgently address those issues in our education system. And I welcome the comments about reskilling in the skills uh, 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 framework and the enterprise agency review document last week. But we need to, again, make sure that our skills infrastructure is as much about reskilling people in the workforce now who f uh, find themselves and their skills obsolete, giving them new skills so that they can re renew and refresh and update and make their skills relevant to the workforce. We also need to bake in technology into our learning. It's not good enough to, to treat technology as something separate within the curriculum. We need to make sure that our pupils in our schools are learning to use technology in English and history and other subjects because, frankly, technology will be per pervasive and part of every single activity that we undertake. And likewise, we need to make sure that we support businesses to tech up. Every single business needs to be a technology business in the economy of tomorrow. We need to make sure that we are focusing as much on software companies uh, and, and as, as, as much on whisky producers being able to use big data to produce the perfect dram and on software and technology companies. So I would just conclude by saying that this is a big change and we have to stop treating it as a novelty. When we faced the unemployment of 12.5% in the 1980s, we viewed that as tragic. And when we're facing a, a potential uh, a, a, a proportion of the workforce being made obsolete of 36%, we need to take that very seriously indeed. And it's happening now and it's happening fast. I think Willie Coffey was absolutely right to highlight the pace of change in technology. We have to recognise that automation, with automation, we face the complete removal of people from the entire chain and the economy, from design to manufacture to the supply of goods that we use every day. And I would like to see the government take automation as seriously as that as it reviews its strategy. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr Jones. I call Patrick Harvey to follow by Marie Todd. Mr Harvey, please. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, we've already had some quite interesting quotes to, to set up the debate and to, and to frame the argument so far. Mr Ewing uh, quoted Bill Gates in his opening remarks, telling us the internet is fast becoming a town square for the global village. No doubt a global village in which the Prime Minister will be appalled to learn that we are all citizens of the world. Uh, I, I see more opportunity in that than threat, uh, but I, I think we, uh, we, we need to recognise the profound change that's coming upon us, uh, as others have mentioned. Uh, Willie Coffey, I think, mentioned uh, Alan Turing, uh, saying, we can see only a short distance ahead. But Alan Turing, let's remember, was writing about thinking machines, what, 70 years ago and more? And while Jamie Green's right that technology is moving very fast in this area, I, I question whether we're really talking about events which were unimaginable uh, a generation ago. Uh, E.M. Forster's science fiction story, The Machine Stops, prefigured ideas like the internet and instant messaging over 100 years ago. And some of the, the, the consequences that Mr. Johnson was talking about around automation, uh, I think we can see taken to an extraordinary extreme by our own uh, late and much lamented Ian e M. Banks in his uh, imagination. I think human beings have always been far better at imagining and inventing uh, these kind of technological changes, better at that than we are at controlling how we use them and how the consequences impact on our lives. And we will keep on imagining and reimagining uh, in this area. Not just the middle management jobs uh, that have been mentioned, uh, who knows, even legislators, even legislators might one day be replaced by AI or software that's as close to AI as makes no practical difference. And the Internet of Things, as Mr. Arthur mentioned, also known, of course, as the Internet of Things People Can Hack, will also have profound positive and negative consequences for all of us. Part of my problem with how we've debated this so far, though, is not about what's in any of the motions uh, or amendments. I'll be supporting all of them very happily, and I welcome a lot of the, the work the government has done in this area. But there are questions that we haven't yet begun to grapple with. Digital participation, for example. What does participation really mean? When we talk about democratic participation, we don't just mean being on the electoral register. We mean having a sense of control and power in the citizenry, uh, the ability to hold power to account. If we talk about economic participation, we don't just mean having a job or having an income. We mean fair work. We mean ensuring that the way the economic systems work benefits the common good. Well, digital participation as well doesn't just mean having a connection. It doesn't just mean having access to some technology or being a passive recipient of software products. I think digital participation means something much richer than that. It should mean something much richer than that that involves a digital rights agenda as well. And that's the amendment that we wrote that has, sadly hasn't been selected for, for debate today. But I think the digital rights agenda is absolutely critical if we want this change to be one that's beneficial. If we want to maximise the social, cultural and economic benefit of the technologies that are being rolled out around the world, we absolutely have to look at issues of digital rights. Let me just give a few examples. We've become much more aware of the state and corporate surveillance around the collection of data and metadata around the world, and the way in which that is being used is already stripping way beyond what most people are actually aware of. Well, if we want the agenda of big data to be one that creates benefits for our society and benefits for people, we absolutely need transparency and control on how that data is being used, either by state or corporate players. If we want some of the, the barriers that Mr Green was talking about, some of the barriers to participation, we should recognise that that implies net neutrality. That implies saying no to the idea that internet service providers can decide which packets of data will get beneficial or preferential treatment in the internet if we all want access, if we all want fair access, and if we want that access to, to networks 
to be something that generates a fair benefit for all of us, net neutrality absolutely has to be a principle. And although the European Union has taken some steps in this direction, it's not nearly as strong as it ought to be, and some individual member states have stronger legislative requirements on net neutrality than the EU itself has. So whatever happens with our future participation in the EU, and I hope that continues in Scotland, we absolutely need to be going further than Europe has gone in the past on principles of net neutrality. There are issues around intellectual property law. Few people other than perhaps the Pirate Party would argue for an abolition of property law, uh, inter intellectual property law. But intellectual property law needs to strike a fair balance between the stimulation of creative goods, the dissemination of creative goods, and fair recompense uh, for the people who've, who've, who've undertaken that creation. And at the moment, the balance is all out of kilter. It doesn't properly uh, promote the dissemination of creative goods. In very many cases, it restricts it. Uh, and for those who are trying to uh, get their first foot in the door of the creative industries, whether it's uh, a, a, you know, a, a back bedroom operation of uh, you know, people coming up with their own software or any other aspect of the creative industries, uh, their fair recompense for their work is often uh, far below the, uh, the, 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 the interests of large corporate players who can decide which relatively narrow aspects of intellectual property they can own, buy, sell and milk. These are just a few of the examples of uh, the digital rights agenda uh, around privacy, around open standards. Freedom of speech is another one uh, which would take a, 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 probably another six minutes to begin to discuss. In closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I again welcome the motion and the amendments, but argue that the Scottish Government's strategy must embrace uh, and develop a digital rights agenda, because the internet isn't just going to be our town square. It's fast becoming critical to every part of our community, our economy, our personal and interpersonal lives. And what matters isn't just what might happen if the machine stops, as E.M. Forster wrote, but what happens if the machine stops working in the common good, stops serving the interests of citizens and puts the interests of the Apples or the Googles or indeed the state players ahead of the interests of citizens? These are wider issues uh, that I, I hope that the government's digital agenda will begin to embrace as it develops in the future. Thank you very much. I call Marie Todd to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Ms Todd, please. Thank you, presiding officer. The benefits of digital in innovation are well documented. We must aim to ensure that Scotland is a global leader in this area of innovation. In order to do this, it is important to have a clear strategy to ensure that technological innovation benefits communities all across Scotland. This motion acknowledges the importance of the role of digital connectivity in any such strategy. And as a representative of the Highlands and Islands, I have to say I appreciate the challenge. I come from an incredible part of the world, high mountains and a breathtaking coastline. The topography and geography of my region are the reason that it's one of the most beautiful areas in the world. But the terrain and the population dispersal poses serious challenges in providing the level of digital connectivity we need across the region. At home, we say we need this connectivity more than most people because we're already hard to reach physically, we must not be hard to reach virtually. So this government's target to deliver 100% super fast broadband all across Scotland is very welcome. From 2013, by the end of this year, fibre optic broadband will have increased from 4% of premises to 84% of premises in the Highlands and Islands. I think that's to be congratulated. Uptake of fibre broadband in the Scottish Highlands has been so high that a clawback clause has kicked in and the Digital Scotland scheme is getting an extra funding boost. A new investment of 2.3 million means that 6,000 more premises will be connected to fibre. Investing in improving the coverage and the quality will have a huge impact on connectivity and it's fantastic news for our region. Rural communities such as the Highlands and Islands face additional challenges not just when it comes to digital innovation and connectivity. We all know the issues of relating to ageing communities, and I've said before in this chamber that we face that ageing demographic more than most in the Highlands and Islands. The delivery of health and social care in rural and remote communities is, and the restricted employment options there 
are, are all challenges, but the high, a high-speed, resilient broadband connection provides the means to overcome these challenges and to transform our communities. In fact, these very challenges have forced organisations and businesses in the region to innovate and to develop solutions and collaborations that have the potential to lead the world. NHS Highland, just one example, have been developing a resilient digital connection through a commercial provider, OmniHub, and providing a robust connection with Armadale Surgery in North West Sutherland. And I have to tell you, if it works there, it will work anywhere. Another example of such a digital innovation in the Highlands and Islands is the Fit House collaboration between NHS Highland, Alban Housing, a housing association, and Carbon Dynamic, an SME developing modular housing. This collaboration has developed houses co-designed with end users, embedded with technology that meets the need of both the person living in the house and the requirements of NHS Highland. This will enable digital gateways to be placed in their homes that will send data to NHS Highland and capture data from modern devices like wearable health monitors, one system for all, the information being captured by a safe, secure network. And with people's consent, this will allow health and care agencies to intervene more quickly if it's appropriate to do so. The Fit Home project is going one step further than most, though. It's also focusing on preventative interventions, using art artificial intelligence developed around case-based analytics, originally developed for the oil and gas industry, and transposing that knowledge base into the health and care field. The project is using digital interventions to increase face-to-face -face contact within the home to improve public service delivery, develop and commercialise digital systems and, through a social enterprise model, reinvest some profit back into health and care delivery. NHS Highland are aiming to keep people in their homes for longer, enable earlier hospital discharge, lower the number of emergency admissions and bringing the latest technology and cutting-edge technical ability into mainstream health delivery. That's what the patients want. Small companies in the Highlands working with the NHS are also creating a range of other state-of-the-art digital applications, which range from using smart devices to send and receive health information, home investigations, home consultations, information and messaging portals for patients with cancer and long-term conditions. Delivering health and care in the community in this way enables jobs to be repositioned back into that community, allowing people to remain or return to more rural communities around Scotland. Creating resilience in these vital areas and job opportunities for the Highlands school leavers and graduates. Presiding officer, collaborations between commerce, the NHS and the third sector are thriving in the Highlands. And these unique alliances are solving problems that each organisation couldn't fix on their own. They're also creating innovative digital health and care solutions that can be exported across the world and might therefore have the potential to feed some much needed money back into our vital public services. The investment and commitment that this government has made in superfast broadband is creating the infrastructure to enable technology companies to locate in the Highlands, not only making the Highlands and Islands a fantastic place to live, but also a world-class place to work. So developing superfast broadband connection has the potential to transform Scotland on many levels, and it is already happening. Thank you. Call on Mike Rumbles to be followed by Graham Simpson. I'd like to begin my contribution by quoting from the SNP government's programme for Scotland. And on page 33 of this document, it says, our commitment is to deliver the superfast broadband access to at least 95% of premises by next year, end of next year, and 100% by the end of this parliament. This will transform connectivity, improving the productivity of businesses in remote and rural areas and the prospects of people who live there. Now, I'm going to return to this because I, at the end of my contribution, that's why I wanted to start with it, because they are grand words full of promise, reiterated again today by Fergus Ewing. Uh, forgive me for being somewhat sceptical of this. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I could give examples of what many 
of the people who have contacted me about this have to say about it. But I don't want to involve them in this debate. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to use my own experiences to give a touch of reality to the debate we've heard so far. I live in a beautiful part of rural Scotland. Not so remote, really, because uh, a trunk road, the A97, runs right past my front door. I mention this because we have a terrible broadband connection. And I, together with my neighbours, were really looking forward to being connected with superfast broadband, as advertised, as it says on the tin, as it were, by the Scottish Government. 18 months ago, we were delighted to see that the roadside outside our homes was being dug up. And guess what? Yes, the superfast broadband cable was being laid right outside our homes, along the length of the A97 at Kildrummy in Aberdeenshire. We were happy to put up with the disruption of the road and all that that made. But yes, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope you may have guessed it. Imagine the disappointment to be told that actually, even though the superfast broadband cable is being laid light right outside your home, you're not going to be connected. This is despite seeing adverts all over the place, all over the local villages, telling us that super vast broadband has arrived. So why is this, one might ask? It can't be the cost of reaching a, uh, us in a remote area. Can it be that? We're not in a remote area, Minister. Well, the super fast broadband cable isn't being delivered to each home, despite the warm words. It's being delivered to a series of green boxes along the route. My house and that of the, my, our neighbours isn't connected to a green box. They're connected to the telephone exchange. So even though the superfast cable is going right by us, we aren't any distance from it, we're not being connected. Now, several members from across the chamber have it was 18 months ago, Stuart, have highlighted their view that it's because the we're in the remote areas that can't really be reached effectively that um, this is slowing the program down. It's the last 5%. Well, I'm afraid it isn't. Now, I have no doubt, and the minister is listening, I've got no doubt that the minister genuinely believes that this rollout program is going well and that the statement made in the government's plan for Scotland is being fulfilled. However, the reality is that broadband access isn't being delivered to every home, just to every green box in the land. I repeat my point. Superfast broadband isn't being delivered to every home or business premises, as promised. And I would be interested to know from the Minister whether my home, and I'm using mine as an example, is being connected because uh, it's being counted. Is it being counted as being connected because the area is connected? Well, I'd like to hear that from the minister rather than from the back benches. And are we actually counting the green boxes that are actually being, well, from a sedentary position, one of my colleagues on the rural committee keeps saying, no, I'd love to hear that from an intervention from the minister. I would like to hear some reassurance, not just for my own benefit, but for all the people in my local community who've contacted me about this. And still, the minister is not intervening on me. I take that, the message that is being given me. Well, I'm being, I want to, I would certainly give way to the minister if you can tell me what to get, yeah, please. Fergus Ewing. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry to hear Mr. Rumbles hasn't been corrected, and if he gives me the details of that, I happy, happily look into it. But does he not accept that, uh, that uh, as I said in, in my opening remarks, that both Audit Scotland and Ofcom, the regulator, have actually uh, judged and highlighted that, that although there is more to do, which I've said in the speech, opening speech, that we are making faster progress in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK, and also that we have clearly set out our plans for a tender exercise next year in order to achieve our target, which of course, as he opened by saying, is the target that we must achieve within the lifetime of this parliament. My so rumbles. The point I'm making is, I'm certain that you believe that. I, I believe that you, in good faith, believe, believe all of this. I'm trying to give you a touch of reality as to what's actually happening out there. I'm also actually... Be <laughs> this was a year and a half ago this went by. I'm being reliably informed from those that are in the position to tell me 
that actually far from improving my already poor broadband service, the likelihood is that this service will actually get worse as those who are, who are being connected will adversely affect the signal. I genuinely believe, if the minister really is of the belief, I hear no no being shouted, that all is well with this programme, and I can go back to my communities in the north of Aberdeenshire and tell them all of this, that 95% of premises will be connected by next year, and that all the premises will be connected by 2021, then either, well, either he's being duped by the providers of the service, or he doesn't understand the contracts the Scottish Government has signed. It's all very well to boast, in his, as he does in the, in the blurb, that 7,700 kilometres of cable have been laid, enough, and I quote, to stretch from Glasgow to Kathmandu, as it says in the Scottish Government. It might be good for Kathmandu, but it isn't certainly any good for Kildrummy. Graham Simpson, to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> um, Scotland's a small nation that could be a demonstration of digital potential. For this, there needs to be trust, security and convenience. Government has to empower citizens, charities and SMEs for potential through innovation to be reached, um, a point made by Patrick Harvey. Now, in her first speech as the UK Information Commissioner, Elizabeth Denham said, it's not privacy or innovation, it's privacy and innovation. Consumer trust is essential to achieving growth. It's this I want to focus on. But first, I want to touch on the wider issue of broadband. Much is said about rural areas missing out on high-speed broadband, but there are many urban areas that do too, and sometimes without any apparent logic, as Mike Rumbles has just touched on. My street in East Kilbride gets high-speed broadband, but just down the road on the same estate, I have a constituent who lives in one of two houses in his street that doesn't. And we have those green boxes very nearby. It's frustrating enough, but what's even more frustrating is that there's no way for him to find out when he'll get connected. And I'd urge the government to act on this specific point because it affects a lot of people. They just need to know when. So back to trust. Scotland is missing out on reaching its full digital potential because there hasn't been enough collaboration between private, third and public sectors. The General Data Protection Regulation provides individuals with increased control over how their personal data is collected and used online. But more can and should be done to ensure that individuals are able to take back control of their online identities. Yes, yeah, certainly. Fair to I mean, The member has asserted that the problem is that there hasn't been collaboration between the Scottish Government and operators. The opposite is the, tr is the truth, since we're the only part of the UK to have an action plan and the mobile operators have commended us for the approach which we are taking here as opposed to south of the border, where in the mobile infrastructure plan only three out of 78 masts promised were actually delivered. Graham Simpson. Thank you. I'm not here to um, have a go at you, Mr Ewing. Um, I'm saying that so, you know, some, some work is being done, but not enough. Um, the European Data Protection Supervisor Giovanni Buttarelli recently gave his views on personal information management systems. He said, our online lives currently operate in a provider-centric system where privacy policies tend to serve the interests of the provider or of a third party rather than the individual. Using the data they collect, advertising networks, social network providers and other corporate actors are able to build increasingly complete individual profiles. This makes it difficult for individuals to exercise their rights or manage their uh, personal data online. A more human-centric approach is needed, which empowers individuals to control how their personal data is collected and shared. And I agree with that. It's human nature to resist snooping and meddling in your life. Now, Scotland will face cyber security threats now and in the future. Citizens look to the government I say government, that could be UK government, it could be Scottish government, for safety and security. They do not look to any government to spy on them. 
Local authorities still ask citizens to fill in paper forms and have made no real progress in enabling citizens to live their own lives with dignity, in control, and with their own choice of digital identity that is privacy friendly. Their attitudes to sharing data do not raise digital potential hopes as there is no trust. A report by the Market Research Society puts consumers at the heart of the privacy debate, highlighting that up until now, privacy has largely been treated as a, quote, political football, with too much focus on the legal and technological aspects of holding personal data. It shows that only one in 10 of us feel in complete control over our personal information being kept private. It also reveals that government is only marginally more trusted than supermarkets when it comes to looking after personal information and that banks are more trusted than charities. Digital participation is starting in some areas, but is not yet achieving its full potential. Reports such as tackling poverty in Renfrewshire recognise that empowering citizens uh, includes digital empowerment. Think Local, Act Personal and Citizens Online, which has an innovative project in the Highlands, which will please Marie Todd, are examples of this. But citizens do not currently have reasons to use online services provided by the public sector. Public services IT is built for public services organisations and not for citizens. People are excluded. Inequality is perpetuated and Scotland does not benefit from advances in technology. The Carnegie Trust, mentioned by Willie Coffey in his measured speech, recently reported that Scotland is still not yet reaching its potential in digital services. It called for a new focus on uh, tackling digital exclusion. So Scotland will not reach its full, full potential until government trusts others and is trustworthy. That's why reality is so far behind the digital potential. Government must recognise that citizens are the nation's most important asset and empower them so Scotland can reach its full potential. I want to give the Minister one more idea, and that is to look at the issue of procurement. When we're procuring IT projects, we should make sure that Scottish firms get those projects, because far too many don't. So empower citizens, better information, and procurement. Those are three ideas Fergus Ewing to take forward. Gillian Martin, followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, presiding officer. Digital connectivity will have the biggest impact on rural Scotland. And I speak as uh, the, the member for a constituency which is in real need of coverage to bring us up to a par with our urban neighbours. With enhanced connectivity, we can flourish in terms of the amount of businesses that can locate themselves in rural areas or the start-ups that would have a chance of even being in a level playing field with those in an urban environment. Because with today's technology, a graphic designer, business consultant, PR manager or an accountant should be able to work remotely from anywhere and still deliver the same level of service as someone working from an office in a town or city high street. We shouldn't all have to travel miles from our rural homes into a city to sit at a desk and clog up the roads to do a job that can just as satisfactorily be done at the end of a phone and with a decent broadband connection. And with Scottish Enterprise estimating that to bring Scotland's productivity up to an optimum level, we need 100, 150,000 new businesses to be created. In my view, digital connectivity for our rural areas is key to meeting this target. In the business I ran before coming to Parliament, I could work from home uploading video files of my work for clients to review and holding Skype meetings with clients in other cities and countries. If I'd lived just three miles to the east in maybe Foveran or Ardney Station, I wouldn't have stood a chance. Like one of my constituents, just a quarter of a mile outside the village of Fivey, who called me to last week to say that he would have to move as he was struggling to run his graphic design business without access to broadband. But on a basic level, one of the most constraining things about poor access to broadband is the lack of access to everyday services and advantages that being online can provide. And I suppose I'd call this digital justice or digital equality. 
In my constituency, I have a recent example which really brought it home to me how internet poverty could impact on a community's options and success. In New Pitt Sligo, we had an unfortunate situation where a local bakery, which had been established for over 100 years, John Smith & Sons, was forced to close permanently. My colleague Ailey Whiteford MP and I worked with the group responsible for the bakery and the staff who faced redundancy to help them through the process and try and find them alternative work and access support. Many of Smith's employees had not had to look for work in many, many years as they had been long-serving employees of the bakery and Smith's was the single business, biggest employer in the village. And I must admit that in, temp in attempting to give practical advice to some of the workers, I did not anticipate how much of an issue their lack of digital connectivity would be. In May this year, New Pitt Sligo wasn't particularly well connected digitally and most of the people who came to seek support were not online. And additionally, New Pitt Sligo does not have particularly good mobile signal, so many didn't even have mobile phones. How does one even attempt to find a job in 2016 without access to the internet? The Monster.coms and the S1 Jobs, the LinkedIn's and the Human Resources pages on the company website with the most up-to-date recruitment opportunities was not available to most of the people who came to us for help. And neither were the online resources that allowed them to access the, set, the advice and information they needed to access uh, job seeker allowance that they were entitled to until they found new work. Their employment opportunities were limited because of their internet poverty and were compounded by their rural location being serviced by very few buses that would actually get them to facilities that were better connected and publicly available. Many of them actually didn't even have an email address. Rural homes have been uh, disadvantaged as well when it comes to accessing services like distance learning programmes, like those offered by the Open University, or setting up a business from home, accessing savings offered by internet shopping, or changing ed energy tariffs online, or even accessing news out with that broadcast on traditional media, or using internet banking. And isn't it amazing that internet banking isn't available to the very places who need it the most, those without an actual bank? The biggest unleashing of potential has to come from rural areas like this, with 100% broadband broad coverage uh, promised by 2021. Not only will we be directly tackling digital inequality, but potentially dramatically increasing Scotland's productivity. But I'd like to end by maybe sort of picking up some of the things, that the, the criticisms that have come from uh, Mr. Rumbles um, and, and Mr. Mountain about um, Issues. I've just been reading a thing in the, tele the Telegraph where your own leader, Tim Farron, actually... It doesn't matter whether I read it. Your own leader, Tim Farron, actually criticised the regulator for some of the issues that you've just described. And it seems to me that he maybe has a better grasp on the technology and who's actually to blame for the, the, the type of issues that you describe. I suggest that you look it up. He, he criticises BT Openreach and Ofcom for BT's continued monopoly of this and ask for action there. Not necessarily the government that's trying to make things better. They can't be blamed, can they? They can't possibly do that. Monica Lennon to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The importance of the digital world to the smooth operation of daily life is something which I must admit I can often take for granted. To be connected to the internet is a vital part of daily life, whether it be for sending work emails, communicating with friends and family, or checking social networks. For the range of uses that we put it to, internet use has simply become second nature for so many of us. Even here in the chamber, I know I can include myself among the group of MSPs who frequently check our mobile devices to respond to emails. It's allowed now, isn't it? Carry out a quick uh, <laughs> fact check or send out all important tweet. We all do it. The digital world exists alongside and is indeed now interwoven with our reality and it provides so many opportunities for growth and increased productivity. I welcome the recognition in the motion for debate today that digital connectivity is vital to achieving Scotland's full potential in the digital world and that the government will build on its 2011 digital strategy. However, achieving Scotland's full potential in the digital world requires not only the delivery of infrastructure, but also the ability for Scotland's population to access that infrastructure and to be equipped with the skills to use it. I therefore welcome Rhoda Grant's amendment to the motion. Even if we are to achieve the goal of access to the 100% superfast broadband by 2021, there will still be work to do to ensure that everyone can access the internet, regardless of their income or location. 
The biggest risk to not achieving our full potential in a digital world very obviously comes from the inequity of provision when it comes to access to the internet and the skills required to use it. We know that deprivation hampers the progression of Scots in many ways, from educational atten attainment to health outcomes, and the link between deprivation and internet use is no different. It has been a persistent problem that contributes to a vicious circle of inequality and one that needs urgently addressed if we are to make use of the potential digital talent from, from all of Scotland's population. The 2015 Scottish Household Survey published in September this year found that just 60% of households with an income of £15,000 per year or less had access to the internet, compared with 98% of households with incomes over £40,000. In research from Ipswich Moray, commissioned by the Carnegie uh, Trust, as others have mentioned, an analysis of that survey data finds a strong degree of overlap between digital exclusion and commonly cited characteristics of deprivation. We know that those who are older or on lower incomes or living in more deprived areas are statistically less likely to have digital access compared to the rest of the population. Closing the digital divide must be a vital component of the government strategy going forward if reaching our full potential in the digital world is to be achieved. I fully believe that this is entirely possible, but only if all relevant partners are working together to more closely monitor the levels of internet access and are making the necessary interventions and investment to tackle areas which need improvement. Certainly. Derek Mackay. Absolutely agree with Monica Lennon in tackling the digital divide. As we approach our reshaping of the strategy, are there any specific suggestions that the member would like to make to inform that strategy so that we do tackle the digital uh, divide? And I hope that will be uh, taken in the spirit in which the question is offered. Monica Lennon. Thank you. I'd be more than happy to, to email you after today to, to um, make some suggestions. Um, what I'd like to move on to is, is maybe talk about some examples uh, of projects in my area and show how we could con continue to support those. Um, what I was about to say is that the benefit of expanding internet access to those who are currently without it are numerous, from young people in education, we had some in the gallery, but they've gone, uh, and to those who are searching for employment. In Central Scotland, the area I represent, I recently visited a community development charity, Community Links in South Lanarkshire, which operates a, a range of projects aimed at tackling poverty. I met with volunteers and service users at the Select Hub at Hill House in Hamilton, and that's a digital inclusion project uh, run by volunteers and staff to support people to use the internet as an employability tool. Local people use the service to increase their digital skills, including to apply for, for jobs. And what I find it was really popular amongst older people who are aiming to retrain and are finding it difficult to navigate online only applications, such as those used by the Department of Working Pensions for applications for job seekers allowance. And I declare an interest as a South Lanarkshire councillor. The Select Hub is jointly funded by South Lanarkshire Council's Tackling Poverty Fund and the Scottish Government's People and Communities Fund. So it's a really good example of good practice in relation to community-led digital inclusion. The service users I met were really clear about the benefits of the project and the huge difference it can make to, to them uh, and otherwise free access to the internet and a helping hand that they, they wouldn't have. So I hope the projects like the Select Hub and others like it will continue to attract support from the government. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, expanding digital access is a vital component in tackling inequality. It will help not only individuals, but will also boost the position of Scotland as a world-class digital nation if more and more people have the digital skills which enable them to get on in life. So I welcome the Scottish Government's motion and its support for Scottish Labour's amendment today. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Emma Harper. Uh, presiding officer, I suspect at the end of my contribution I may be adjudged either a iconoclast or heretic. Um, I'm reminded of on the 23rd of July 1633, Jenny Herriot uh, threw her stool at the minister in St Giles Cathedral at the first use of the Anglican Common Book of Prayer. Um, she uh, sought to overturn the prevailing norms. And I'm going to do something rather similar. I don't think any of this digital stuff matters at all. What actually we really should be debating is communication and services. 
because that's what we're actually trying to get to. Digital is merely one of a range of ways in which we might support these broader aims. Communication. Let's just talk about communication. The Roman Empire had a series of hilltop uh, signalling posts that enabled the message to get from Londinium to Roma in a mere six hours. It didn't work at night and it didn't work if there was fog or low cloud. But a lot of the time, it meant the pretty good, for 2,000 or so years ago, communication from the outposts of the empire to the center. And that was one of the reasons why the Roman Empire was so much more uh, successful than the Greek Empire, who was still sending messages around with cleft sticks and a message there. Or alternatively, it was a secret message, shaving the head of the slave, writing the message on there, waiting till the hair grew, and then sending the slave off. It took months. So what we're actually talking about and we're interested in uh, is uh, communication. And uh, communication, too, is something that in the digital world has been around a lot longer than we might think. Uh, the Scots invented the first uh, fax machine in the 1840s. It was probably analog rather than digital, and the technology we use today is very different. But the telegraph, which was the first real digital communication medium, was the key thing that opened up America. Took communications to the West Coast, made that big country whose future we will be all watching with interest next week. The first uh, telegraph line between Edinburgh and London, was op private telegraph line, was opened in 1868 when the Bank of Scotland, uh, for whom I worked for 30 years, installed the telegraph line between head office at the Mound and its office in Broad Street uh, in London. Uh, the telephone came along a wee bit later in 1882. Uh, like banks everywhere, they were cautious about technology and the board only approved the telephone on the strict understanding it not be used to conduct uh, business. Um, computers, too, have been around for quite a long time. There were astrological computers used by the, in Arabia over a thousand years ago. I will. Edward Mountain. I, I, I... I'm almost amazed at how, how much knowledge the member has and, and, and hoping that we're going to move beyond faxes shortly and get to broadband. Could I encourage the member to, to, to ask how we're going to get broadband into the remote parts of the Highland to be weaved into his history? <clears throat> We can, Mr. We, can, Stevenson. we can certainly do that, of course, uh, but I will say in part that the broadband is not necessarily digital. It is actually digital data carried on analog signals. But that's neither here nor there, but it just illustrates why when we talk about digital, we shouldn't get bogged down in all this techie stuff. What we actually want is people to get access to services, access to good communications. Now, I'm disappointed that Mike Rumbles is not here to uh, hear me just mildly correct one or two things. And let me just start by his living next to the trunk road called the A97. Well, that's going to be news to people. There is no trunk road called the A97. The A97 is a local road, the responsibility of the local council. He has been told on umpteen occasions that he is on an exchange on a line, as indeed I am. My exchange is on fibre. I'm not. I'm in the 5%. I'm counted in the 5%. He is counted in the 5%. What, my brother lives in the centre of Edinburgh. He's on an exchange on the line. He's in the 5%. Different technology will be needed to connect. Different kinds of people connecting. For reasons of history that go back more than 100 years to when the first telephones uh, uh, were installed in Scotland in the late 1870s. And some of that wires still around. If I'm, I've got a wee yes. Yes, I will. Daniel Johnson. On one hand, I take the, the, the member's point that, in essence, we're not dealing with something new and that, that it is essentially about communication. However, I think the key difference here is that we're actually facing a change in technology which isn't just about communication, but actually replaces every single step that humans can do in the supply chain across a great broad range of things. And that does need to be addressed and is new in a way that we've never faced before. Oh, Mr. oh Stevenson. by the way, I absolutely agree with the member, because the member is absolutely correct. Um, we have been through this in the mechanical era, uh, when we automated the looms, and we saw the in huge disruptive effect of that. We are going to see the same disruptive effects here. And I think one of the things, not from that source, one of the... Uh, <laughs> 
One, one, of, one of the things, you wouldn't take mine, I've corrected your problems. But please Presiding refrain officer, from having conversations with each other. Could you speak through the I chair, I will address please? my remarks to the, to the chair as I properly uh, should do. I think the big challenge is certainly making sure there's equality of access to the services that we can deliver uh, via the internet. And rural areas at the moment are behind the pace. That's why it's so important by 2021 we get on pace and we are connected. But as we develop these services, we are going to have to look at who gets the rewards for work that is productive. Because a lot of work will be of a social nature, it will be of a cultural nature, because production of goods, the engagement in the delivery of services will employ a lowering proportion of people as time goes on. And that's a fact we'll all have to face, whatever our political views. And we're gonna to have to have that debate about the wider effects of changing the way in which we run the modern world. We also have to consider very carefully, and uh, uh, Patrick Harvey touched on it but didn't develop it, homogeneity versus diversity. If we get to a position where there are very few sources of services, a mistake or an error in the implementation of those service deliverers now have much wider effects. The first law of epigenetics says that the more highly optimized an organism is for one environment, the more adversely effect, affected by a change in that environment the organism is. The bottom line for this debate is that we need diversity of supply, please. diversity of delivery. That way we can move forward together, uh, and I'm sure it, we will do so. I will hope that in future contributions, Mr. Rumbles will take the opportunity to correct the almost totally misleading contribution that he has made today. Presiding officer. Uh, we now move to the last of the open speeches, and Ms. Harper, you have the enviable task of following Mr. Stevenson. <laughs> Thank you very much, presiding officer. I don't know if I can ever compete with Stuart Stevenson in any of my speeches. So, um, we've heard a lot of examples of digital, you know, connectivity things that we can do. Myself, I was part of a surgical team in California who developed robotic surgery so that we could do remote access surgery with a surgeon who wasn't even in the same room as a patient. And that was quite exciting times for me. But today, this afternoon, I want to concentrate on the importance of high quality digital connectivity for rural communities so that Scotland can realize its full digital potential and the importance for social inclusion, business growth and development and provision of public services. In a very rural region such as St. Fries and Galloway, digital connectivity is increasingly important. Indeed, it's vital to a wide range of activities. It's the number one issue for many of the constituents that I speak to. I have already held two broadband surgeries, one in Stranraer and one in Dumfries, with the assistance of Digital Scotland, which was much appreciated and common to both were the concerns that constituents were bringing about the more difficult to connect parts of a very large and very rural area. Many of the constituents still have little or no access to the internet and in several places not even access to mobile phone coverage. It is fair and important though to recognise that good progress is being made with 34,294 premises across Dumfries and Galloway already connected to fibre broadband and capable of receiving download speeds greater than 24 megabits per second. At the end of the first quarter this financial year, 74% of the premises in the region were connected to fibre broadband. That's up from an assumed 26% in 2012. So the progress is significant and demonstrable, and it is important that we don't lose sight of that. And with the 26% of the region still to be connected, recognising good progress shouldn't distract from the significant challenge of rolling out the next generation broadband, and in some cases, any broadband at all, so that the locations and the businesses that are ready to catch up can catch up. Businesses in Galloway are, of course, already capitalising on improved connectivity to expand their operations and exploit new opportunities. 
One of the businesses is Jas P. Wilson, a dealer and manufacturer of forest machinery, um, which the Minister for Employability and Training, Jamie Hepburn, visited recently. They're marketing their products into European countries and developing markets which will allow the company to expand and secure its future as an important local employer. On the other hand, an excellent visitor attraction, the Galloway Activity Centre on the beautiful shores of Loch Cain has no broadband access and little current prospect of being able to arrange broadband at a reasonable cost. They have investigated every option which is currently available and they found that these options are either logistically impossible or require costs the business can't afford. Like Jas P. Wilson, however, they have the potential and the drive to expand what they do and grow as a business and affordable digital connectivity will make a huge difference to their ability to perform and expand. Presiding officer, digital connectivity can also have huge benefits for the delivery of health care and in particular can help patients avoid at least some of the lengthy journeys they previously had to make to manage long-term health conditions. A good example is the nurse-led diabetes clinic at Galloway Community Hospital in Stranraer, where patients can upload data from blood glucose monitors and insulin pumps remotely and video conference with their consultant rather than making the 150 mile round trip to Dumfries or waiting for a consultant appointment in Stranraer. Given that this sound day-to-day -day management is key to long-term well-being for people with diabetes, gives them easy access to the sort of regular appointment that makes a huge difference to the management of a condition which can otherwise be personally debilitating and costly to the NHS if it is poorly managed. Education can also benefit with our digital progress. I know that the Dumfries Learning Town project is looking at ways in which digital connectivity can be used, used to widen the course choice in the senior phase of secondary school where small numbers of students in more rural secondary schools might otherwise not be able to access the variety of specialised higher courses commonly available in their urban counterparts. Finally, presiding officer, I want to touch on mobile coverage and mobile broadband in particular. Mobile coverage in Dumfries and Galloway is patchy and access to mobile broadband even more so, particularly out with the urban centres of population. Indeed, the Regional Tourism Monitor this year highlighted access to mobile broadband as the single issue of greatest concern to tourism businesses. Tourists expect to be able to navigate by their phone, research visitor attractions in the area and make bookings on the move. And increasingly, people expect that of rural areas they wish to visit as much as they would in urban centres. So I warmly welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to working with the UK mobile network operators on an action plan to fill in those blank patches in my region. Presiding Officer, and ha I am happy to support the motion and I have outlined some of the benefits digital connectivity has for rural areas and some of the challenges these same areas face as we become increasingly connected and interconnected. Above all, I am confident that the action the Scottish Government is taking to maximise digital connection and participation across Scotland are the right ones and will help realise Scotland's full potential in a digital world. Thank you. Now we move to the closing speeches and I call on Neil Bibby. Around six minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. This has been an interesting and uh, important debate on a, a wide range of issues and I'll try and touch on some of them. Above all, uh, we've heard from many members uh, across the chamber today on our digital ambition for Scotland and how important con connectivity is for our economy. Uh, I, I agree with one of the key themes emerging from this debate. We cannot and should not underestimate the importance of access to a digital communication structure fit for 21st century Scotland. Just as we rightly expect that our children learn to read and write, in today's Scotland we must also recognise that having knowledge of and expertise in digital communications is absolutely essential if our young people are to access jobs in our economy. And as we've also heard today, it's not just the workforce of tomorrow that needs to be equipped. As Daniel Johnson and other members have said, the companies of today, large and small, need to be able to compete in an increasingly challenging market 
where they are often up against companies whose governments are prepared to invest in state-of-the-art digital infrastructure. We therefore need to recognise, as Audit Scotland have, uh, that we can and must do better in Scotland. Nobody in this chamber would disagree with the four themes outlined in Scotland's digital future, connectivity, digital economy, digital participation and digital public services. But as many members have said, we need to make sure these objectives are being met and delivered in reality on the ground and in our communities. Members today have rightly raised issues facing their constituencies and regions and I will do uh, likewise, like uh, Mr Green, I represent uh, West Scotland, one of the most urbanised and densely populated parts of Scotland, but it also has uh, a number of rural areas. One of the key themes of the debate today has been that of the digital divide, and not just between affluent areas and areas um, of material uh, deprivation. As Rhoda Grant said earlier, the market has provided for many areas, uh, but rural areas and indeed too many urban areas have been left uh, behind. Tom Arthur, I think, was right to raise the issues in his constituency affecting uh, how people in Howard uh, and Loch Winnick. And one of the examples that I like to raise is, is in Scotland's largest town in Paisley, where there are uh, still many uh, issues about broadband. A number of householders in Hawkhead uh, are living in new homes but using uh, dial up broadband. That's despite uh, residents seeing the developers installed the necessary infrastructure. There are a number of other examples in, in my region, and I'm sure other members have talked about it in their areas as well, where households are still unable to access fibre optic broadband because they're directly connected to the local telephone exchange and not through a green cabinet. Now, these problems, as has been mentioned, are, are problems experienced in recent years. It can be resolved with effort, application and uh, investment. Many members, though, have, have rightly made the point that what is far more difficult is the one of access by those who don't have the resource or the training to be able to benefit from what our new digitally enhanced society uh, can offer. It's therefore important, as the Minister said at the start, um, and as other members have done, to recognise the generational digital divide. We cannot ignore the elderly households whose bewilderment of this new technology excludes them from the financial advantages of being able to control their heating system, for example, from um, a smartphone? Why should they be excluded from the best online deals for goods and services just because they don't have access to a computer or a smartphone? Um, Emma Harper and Marie Todd made some very good, important points about um, the NHS and the role of technology, but we have to also, um, as we develop telecare systems of, of, in social care, we need to ensure that those elderly and disabled uh, people already on the wrong side of the digital divide uh, are in no way disadvantaged. Um, I thought Willie Coffey made some very important points about digital inclusion and uh, the use of uh, uh, digital technology as a tool for tackling social justice. Uh, and if we are serious in this parliament about tackling poverty, we need to be serious about digital inclusion. Why should poorer households with the lowest disposable incomes be forced to pay the highest prices, prices which members in this chamber can avoid because of their ability to access the internet? And I think Monica Lennon made some very important points about the scale and the, the numbers of people that do not have access uh, to the internet. If we truly want a digitally inclusive society, then it must address those households and communities that are being left behind. President officer, many of our councils are trying their best to bridge the digital divide. Monica Lennon talked about examples in South Lanarkshire uh, with a number offering computer and internet access in libraries and other uh, public facilities. But I have to ask, it would be remiss not to, how our uh, councils will be able to continue to offer this access to the excluding disadvantaged if their budgets are being uh, slashed, forcing them to make even harsher cuts. I hope the uh, Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government will tell us how they will fund and ensure public access to digital facilities right across uh, Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government, I think, must also consider how they support the expansion of town centre access to modern fast broadband as Renfrewshire Council wants to do to deliver in its uh, town centres. As members have said, digital inclusion is also uh, vital in terms of education and skills, and Daniel Johnson made some very important points about the number of STEM teachers that have been cut and computing science teachers uh, that have been cut as well. It should not be left to those children whose parents can afford it, either at home or through private education, to have access to iPads, tablets and other 
uh, digital devices. Such devices are becoming the norm for communication and also for research and for learning. It cannot be right that young people in deprived communities are trying to enter a competitive workforce without having the same familiarity with modern systems as young people from more affluent backgrounds. In closing, presiding officer, uh, we can say that we want to break down barriers to invest in infrastructure and do what is required for those individuals and households where age, income or connectivity is leaving them behind. But we need to follow that up with real meaningful uh, action. That's why we will support the government to provide digital infrastructure and access to it that is world leading. But we also hold them to account where they must do better. Colin Myrtle Fraser. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been actually a very interesting debate with thoughtful uh, and well-informed contributions uh, from all sides. All the better because it must be the first debate we've had in quite a while. There's been hardly a mention of Brexit, uh, although the Cabinet Secretary couldn't really help himself eight minutes into his speech, uh, and not a single mention of a second independence referendum. So long may that trend uh, continue. <laughs> now, we had uh, Mike Rumble's um, talking about his uh, frus frustration with his green box uh, beside his non-existent trunk road. Uh, and we had the customary history lesson from uh, Stuart uh, Stevenson. Although, if I can correct one thing, I think if he checks, you'll find that the riot in St Giles on the 23rd of July 1637 wasn't occasioned by the reading of the Anglican uh, Book of Common Prayer, but a new Common Prayer book devised specifically uh, for Scotland. Well, the members are getting brief intervention on that point. On, on, on that point. Yes, of course. He's Mike also run a number of other issues, one of which, of course, was there was no such thing as the Greek Empire, which he kept talking about. But um, he was wrong in so many things, I can't list them here. I, I, Martin I, Martin sim I simply wanted to say to Mr. Stevenson, if he's interested in reading more about the politics and history of the mid-17th century in Scotland, I can recommend a very good book that was written last year <laughs> that's still available in good bookshops. <laughs> now... That's not the only reason I welcome uh, this debate. The digital economy has, has long been an interest of mine. In my very first speech I made in the Scottish Parliament in 2001, I talked about what was then called the new economy and the need for better connectivity in rural areas. And I went back and reread that speech. And interestingly enough, in that debate, the word broadband was not even mentioned, never mind uh, superfast broadband. But the principles, of course, are uh, the same. Now, in opening the debate, uh, the Cabinet Secretary referred to his award. I congratulate him on his award, incidentally, uh, for politics and business at Politician of the Year Awards uh, last week. He congratulated, as I do, uh, Joanne Lamont for being e-politician of the year. Despite being nominated three times in a row, I was once again cruelly snubbed by the judges. Uh, but there's always, there's always next year, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was uh, struck uh, by uh, contributions uh, from much younger members than myself, um, recognizing how much society has changed. Jamie Green uh, reading out from the Daily Record of the 1st of January uh, 2000, how they thought the world was changed. Tom Arnold, I thought, was very good setting out some of the, the changes he's seen to in his much shorter lifetime than mine. And we've come a long way in 15 years. We now have a Scottish government that's got a manifesto commitment to delivering superfast broadband to 100% of properties by 2021, and a UK government committed to a universal service obligation. But there's a lot of challenges ahead. In their briefing for this debate, the Federation of Small Business tell us that three quarters of Scottish firms say that digital technologies are essential or important to their plans for growth. And to make the most of these opportunities, firms need access to the right infrastructure and the right skills. And Willie Coffey and his contribution touched on the, the need for the skills to be available in the uh, workforce. According to FSB's survey in June of this year, 83% of Scottish premises could access superfast broadband compared to 89% of premises south of the border. And sadly, superfast broadband rollout for small or medium-sized businesses tends to lag behind the rollout for the wider population. And as we've heard throughout this debate, there's a particular issue in rural areas. Uh, Rhoda Grant, uh, Edward Mountain, and Marie Todd all refer to the situation in the Highlands. Uh, and I know from my own experience in areas such as uh, Perthshire and Stirlingshire, we have large gaps still in terms of broadband provision. But it's not just rural areas that need attention. Graham Simpson reminded us that uh, there are many urban locations which have similar uh, problems. There's a big problem with a lack of mobile connectivity in large parts of Scotland. Emma Harper reminded us of that just a few uh, moments ago, and Scotland is worse place than the rest of the UK. I remember in my early years in the Parliament, 
when, when we had an issue around mobile phone masks, it was largely because people would come to their MSPs to complain about mobile phone masks because people thought that the uh, radio waves would fry their brains or their children's brains. Now when people come to complain about mobile phone masks, it's because they're not being built fast enough. And I think there's more can be done to encourage the operators in terms of sharing of masks. Yes, of course, I'll give way. Derek Mackay. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point around the existing and new mobile phone masks. And would Murdo Fraser then welcome the actions to extend permitted development to encourage mobile operators to extend and deliver the kind of technology that will achieve the coverage that we all want to see? Murdo Fraser. I, I, in a spirit of consensus, I'm very happy to agree with that point from the, from the Cabinet Secretary about uh, how we can encourage the private sector to, to work together to deliver these masks more efficiently and get involved in sharing of masks, which I think uh, is important. But what I'd like to touch on, uh, having talked about the private sector, is the situation in the public sector where a number of members, Daniel Johnson and Graham Simpson, made reference to this. On Tuesday, we saw the launch of the State of the State report from uh, Deloitte and Reform, which contains a whole lot of very interesting information about the future of the public services. And as Daniel Johnson reminded us, it says that more than 800,000 public sector jobs could be lost across the UK by 2030 because of automation. Now, that would save something like £17 billion annually in wages compared to this current year. Now, the such a shift would be gradual, um, but it does show the challenges we face in terms of the changing workforce, but the potential for lower costs to in delivery of the public services. And yet, as the report makes clear, digital transformation is struggling to meet this ambition. Many of those interviewed for the report told the authors that they felt their organisation should be more digitally advanced than they've been able uh, to uh, achieve. One permanent secretary said he felt his department was always a year away from an outcome. The head of a national body in Scotland is quoted as saying, we are at digital 1.0, but digital 3.0 or 4.0 is where we need to be. And sadly, the experience of too many in the public sector moving towards digitised systems has been a negative one. Another public leader quoted in the report said, we have wasted time digitising systems that weren't fit for purpose in the first place. It's rethinking these systems that will radically improve productivity. Um, I think I'm probably in my last minute. Yeah, I'm so, I apologise. Now, our experience uh, in the public sector in Scotland with IT systems is not always a happy one. We all know about the IT system for the Common Agricultural Policy uh, payments, 158% over uh, the original uh, budget and Audit Scotland said of that, we do not expect this programme to deliver value for money. The IT system for NHS 24, 73% over budget and four years later than originally planned. And Police Scotland had to abandon their project intended to provide a unified integrated IT system to the country's police force, which had been due to go live in December of 2015. The Deloitte's uh, report quotes the leader of one national agency saying, most people in the public sector would rather die in a ditch than roll out a large IT system. It will end their career. Now, views like that are disappointing, but perhaps not surprising. We need to get better in the public sector if we really want to fulfil our potential in the digital world. The opportunities are there for greater efficiency, Please, more productive public services, and at the moment we are simply not making it work. So I think there's room for improvement in both public and private sectors. I think we have seen in this debate that the way forward is to work together and in the spirit of consensus we're happy to support both the Labour amendment and the government motion. Thank you. I call on Derek Mackay to close this debate. Up to eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think uh, it has been a constructive, very helpful and consensual debate with a number of uh, fair suggestions uh, made that will feature in our refreshed uh, digital strategy. But to pick up exactly where Murdo Fraser left on to achieve that transformation, yes, we will need to be bold and radical and work across the public and the private sector and work in partnership. And I've been doing so with the digital lead that I have at the Scottish Leaders Forum, working with local authorities just today, uh, working with a, with a range of people with an involvement in digital. And certainly that uh, approach uh, will will continue as we embark on doing things differently to be able to realise our share, clearly shared digital uh, ambitions. I want to cover as many points as possible that members have fairly raised through the course of the, the debate. First of all, in terms of uh, Edward uh, Mountain's point, I think it's, it's correct to draw uh, attention to the fact that uh, the uh, fibre infrastructure will not physically reach every part of Scotland. We'll take it as far as we possibly can, but there will have to be other 
technology solutions for the areas we can't physically reach to achieve the 100% coverage of superfast broadband uh, that we want to achieve whilst uh, expanding uh, on mobile as well. So it is beyond just fibre, then that was a very fair point uh, to make. Uh, Jamie Green covered issues of digital participation, as did Patrick Harvey. Also, the use of data and the potential of public sector uh, transformation. And also a sense that things in the past felt quite uh, futuristic, I, I suppose, and it's a, a further lesson in how we should try and future-proof as much as we can uh, going forward in recognition of the technology mix uh, that will be there. Uh, Rhoda Grant uh, covered um, the the, the potential of the strategy refresh and made a number of suggestions that must turn into actions. That's a fair point. It can't just be rhetoric. There must be clear actions coming from that strategy. And I hope that you will uh, believe that is the case when we're able to publish it next year. And one of the reasons that we can't publish it now, it connects to Neil Bibby's question around resourcing for capital, for infrastructure. And the actual connectivity, of course, is closely aligned if with the autumn statement, uh, the budget that I will propose, and then what parties bring to the table as well and only as recently as a few hours ago I met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to discuss our requests around uh, a capital stimulus and supporting the economy so we can grow the economy and of course and tackle the, the digital uh, divide uh, as well. Uh, Willie Coffey covered the progress, the rapid progress in technology and he's well placed to talk about that. I'm not talking about his longevity but his experience uh, in the, the sector and how can we stay ahead at the cutting edge of doing things differently like other small European nations that do actually have a different culture. That, you know, I, I kind of, they've focused the mind on how they want to use data in a safe way but to deliver better public services and I do think we have uh, some, something to learn from some of those uh, nations. I, I would say to Tom Arthur, I heard his and other members' concerns around constituency coverage and that experience, and of course that must be taken on board. Uh, equally, uh, Daniel Johnston's comments around productivity, uh, automation and smart technology has downsides that we need to consider as we accept there are positives on that uh, journey as well. In terms of particular expertise, it was refreshing to hear from uh, Emma Harper and her personal expertise and involvement in how technology transformed uh, surgery and of course uh, Stuart Stevenson's ever-present expertise uh, on this uh, uh, subject and to Murdo Fraser I have to say I was up for a politician of the year award as well but I can say with all modesty to Murdo Fraser he was robbed <laughs> as a politician uh, of the year but all credit to Joanne uh, Lamont. Patrick Harvey uh, was creative and and use quotes to make the point around uh, digital, and very, very important points around digital uh, participation uh, as well. So I'll quote from Steve Jobs, who said, great things in business are never done by one person, they're done by a team of people. And that maxim applies equally to government, hence the, the double act, the kind of silver surfer, uh, that is uh, Mr Ewing, and maybe the Maybe the salt and pepper surfer, that is me, thanks to Jackson Carlaw for exposing my uh, previous uh, issues. Uh, but I can say that this partnership will ensure that the physical infrastructure is there, working with Mr Swinney on skills and uh, me taking forward public service transformation, then hopefully will uh, deliver uh, along uh, this, uh, this route. When we publish the refresh strategy, hopefully it will cover all the areas of interest across the public and the private sector. It's not just a, a government strategy, but a strategy indeed uh, for Scotland that looks at skills, physical infrastructure, cyber security that some members have touched upon. And of course, we want to engage uh, on that to continue building the picture of what will work for Scotland. So today, I'm delighted to announce that we have launched an online and interactive dialogue app so that we can capture a wider and more diverse range of views as we take our strategy forward. Now, the possibilities that digital creates for our citizens are vast, and how citizens engage with society, government, and access public services, and how we deliver those services more efficiently and effectively, how people manage their health, and a whole host of other services, how they learn, how they engage, and how we get more out of the education system as well, and how businesses operate and can capitalise uh, on the opportunities that exist. Now, we are making significant progress in promoting digital participation. Over 80% of Scots now use the internet, and between 2013 and 2015, 
There was a 20% increase in broadband access at home among social housing tenants from 42% to 63%. And that's why our digital inclusion uh, toolkit is so important to expand upon that. The Scottish Wide Area Network, telecoms uh, section in terms of reaching out through the public sector and further interventions to tackle the digital divide. Uh, presiding officer, I could go through a range of actions that we're taking, but some good examples of where e-services have worked well has included e-planning and e-building standards that are projected to save £73 million over five years, having cost just under £2 million. So that digital first approach uh, to services can make a difference for the client uh, and uh, the determining uh, body. But we want to enhance uh, business digital capabilities as well. The Enterprise uh, Skills Review will support us uh, in that. So will new in initiatives such as CivTech that I've had the pleasure of being involved with and harnessing new support uh, to support the talents of uh, technology startup companies to address our joint civic uh, challenges. A range of other uh, in interventions will uh, support our, our digital strategy to capitalise on those opportunities in the wider economy. And one brief mention of Brexit, I have engaged with the sector. They do say there are serious challenges about loss of expertise and we must take those concerns uh, seriously. But of course, focus on the opportunities uh, before us to build our economy, tackle the digital divide, transform our public services in a way that focuses on the new infrastructure that will re release the potential uh, of our country and partly the way that Daniel Johnston described as this is very much investment well worth uh, supporting and with the consensus I believe uh, that we have established in the chamber today puts us on a very strong footing as we take that uh, revised strategy forward. Thank you. That concludes our debate on realising Scotland's full potential in the digital wor world. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion, and I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 2121 on behalf of the parliamentary bureau on the council tax uh, substitution of proportion Scotland order. Formally moved. Thank you. I'll now call on uh, members to speak in the debate, and each member shall have up to three minutes. I call on Andy Whiteman to speak to and move Amendment 2121.1. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Scottish Green Party MSPs will be voting for the statutory instrument this evening, regardless of what reasoned amendments end up as part of the final motion. The substance of tonight's vote is whether the statutory instrument is approved by Parliament or not. It should be. We have very considerable criticisms of the overall approach of the Scottish Government in this matter, however, but we do agree on some matters. We agree with the First Minister as advisor on poverty and inequality, Naomi Eisenstadt. We agree with previous commissions, including the Burt Commission. We agree with statements made by the First Minister on this matter in previous sessions. And we agree with the Commission on Local Tax Reform in their first recommendation that, and I quote, the present council tax system must end. The statutory instrument does not do that. It merely provides a tepid reheat of a discredited system. But I repeat, we will be supporting the statutory instrument. Tonight, we will be voting for it. We do so because it provides an extremely modest but welcome step in making the council tax, probably the most regressive tax in the UK, that little bit less regressive. But as a tax proposal, it is fatally flawed since people's tax liabilities will be, taking, will be uh, levied without an accurate or up-to-date assessment of the tax base. The consequence is that many people will be paying more tax who should be paying less. But whilst this debate is technically about this modest change, it's actually about something more fundamental. This parliament, at this time, four and a half years out from the next election, has a unique opportunity to build a majority for far-reaching reform that strengthens local democracy accountability and fiscal autonomy that endorses a fiscal framework for future local government settlements that provides communities with real power to choose for themselves the scope, the extent and the quality of local services and how they will be funded. My amendment alters nothing in relation to the legislation. It doesn't alter the bans, the multipliers, the rates. 
What it does do is to provide Parliament with an opportunity to express its views on the future of local taxation and local democracy. Will the council tax ever be abolished? Who knows? Will the council tax ever be based on an accurately assessed tax base? Who knows? Will local government in Scotland be granted the kinds of fiscal freedoms enjoyed by municipalities and councils across most of Europe? Who knows? Above all, will this statutory instrument become law tonight? It will if the SNP votes for it. This evening's debate makes it clear that the ball is in the SNP's court. If they vote for the motion, it will pass. If they abstain, they will let the Tories win. Next week, our minds will turn to further important matters. Let us pass this legislation tonight. I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Derek Mackay to speak to and move amend uh, amendment to amendment 2121.1.1. My amendment delivers the key points in the Greens amendment. This government recognises the importance of local accountability and local democracy, and we agree to continued discussion on the reform of local taxation. But crucially, we insert a key aim of embedding fairness and progressive taxation into those reforms. The Greens amendment doesn't mention progressive taxation as to enjoy the support of the Tories, of course, only long enough for the Tories to then pull their support in a bid to halt an increase in council tax for higher value properties, despite their own manifesto proposition. Opportunistic opposition may well be convenient, but the mature and responsible actions of a parliament of minorities requires opposition not only to provide a critique, but principles on which we can all build. And surely fairness is one. This SSI is purely about the council tax multipliers considering the proposal that won the support of the local government committee. It is a proposal that according to the Resolution Foundation will see council tax become fairer and more proportionate. In their report of April this year, Resolution stated that this policy would raise revenue in a progressive manner with the tax rise falling harder on higher income households. It will see council tax bills increase for those who live in properties in bands E to H while protecting those on low incomes from any change and protecting the 75% of taxpayers who live in bands A to D. Changing bands E to H will generate £100 million each year of additional revenues for local authorities and this is £100 million local authorities would not otherwise receive. We will continue to engage with local government on distribution matters and have been clear that every penny raised in council tax stays with that local authority. And I've also set out to the chamber and to the committee this government's commitment that the steps we are taking today are simply the first in a journey of reform. These are the earliest changes we can make which ensures that additional resources are available to councils from April. Over this Parliament, we can work together to make local taxation fairer. Both the First Minister and I have put that on the record and I gave that commitment to committee. If Parliament votes for our amendment tonight, that principle will be embedded in future reforms. Next month, I will bring a budget to this chamber. I've already written to each party asking for your proposals so we can enter into a constructive discussion. We must be able to go into that discussion knowing that it will be based on positive engagement on all sides, on honouring commitments, and that this Parliament embraces new powers, we all have a duty to show that we are beyond the party political games on such significant matters. I move the amendment in my name. I now call on Graeme Simpson. Presiding officer, we sit here today in uncharted waters. Parliament could be about to vote to allow the Scottish Government to impose a tax rise on local government, claw that money back and then spend it at, as it sees fit on a nationwide school attainment fund. It's totally unprecedented. Let's first of all be clear, we on these benches are in favour of a school attainment fund. We need to close the attainment gap after nine years of failure by the SNP. I imagine the Chamber will be united on that, the first part anyway. But as the Green Amendment makes clear, funding a measure, any measure, by the Scottish Government 
on the back of councils is an attack on local democracy and local accountability. As I said in a previous debate on this matter, it is a basic principle that money should be spent by those elected to raise it, those who are answerable for it to the electors. So if council tax increases, then it should be spent by councils. It should be entirely a matter for East Renfrewshire Council, for example, to decide how to spend the £4 million raised by increasing the amounts charged in the top four bands, or Edinburgh, it's £15.6 million, or South Lanarkshire, it's £5.5 million. However, in a financial slate of hand that would do Derren Brown proud, Derek Mackay will allow local authorities to keep their extra council tax, because legally he has to, but will take it back by cutting grants. It's the first time this has ever happened, and it's a slippery slope. We'll be voting for the amendment, Andy Whiteman's amendment, because it rightly points out the grave way this undermines local accountability and autonomy. Accountability because it's councillors who should be answerable to the people for council tax. And autonomy because it's councillors who should decide how it is spent. Other opposition MSPs accepted this when we last debated this and voted that way with one exception. Will they stand by those principles today and vote against these measures? I hope so, because principle is in short supply in politics. Simply noting the issues does not go far enough. If you truly believe in localism, and we do, then the only way to vote is against this national tax which has been dressed up as local. If this goes through, then people should be in no doubt when they get their council tax bills next year that part of the increase is nothing to do with their councils and everything to do with the SNP and anyone who has voted with them today. And I call on Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. Can I, can I make clear in rising to support Andy Whiteman's mention, uh, amendment that the Scottish Labour Party will also be supporting the statutory instrument tonight? I think, as Andy Whiteman said, it's movement and it's modest, but no, no, nevertheless, it's welcome. And that's the view I think local authority leaders take across Scotland, is that uh, any additional funding would be better than no additional funding whatsoever. But there are a couple of key points that need to be made. Firstly, if it was so unfair, if the council tax was so unfair in 2007, and John Swinney made clear the council tax was unfair, Nicola Sturgeon made clear the council tax was unfair. Indeed, she went further and said that tinkering with the bans was not good enough and the council tax had to go. If it was so unfair in 2007, how is it suddenly fair today? And how, how could Derek Mackay possibly claim that? Secondly, in terms of continuing with the discussion, the fact is that the Scottish Government set up a commission that everybody in here, apart from the Tories, signed up to. The one broad agreement that we all had was that the council tax was passed at sale by date and it had to go. How many more discussions does Derek Mackay want to have before he'll make the right decision and get rid of the unfair council tax? And he talks, he talks about his budget and bringing forward his budget. The fact is that £100 million will be raised through the statutory instrument tonight, and that's why we will support that. But Derek Mackay then intends to take £100 million out of the local government grant in order to fund what is a national priority. So he didn't have the guts to be honest with the people of Scotland and say that we will fund education directly by increasing taxes. He's going to hide behind local government. Unlike the Labour Party, by the way, because we were quite clear, we would fund money going direct to schools, £100 million, and we would do so by increasing the top rate of taxation. That's the difference. We were honest with the voters when we went forward. So I would say at this stage to Derek Mackay, we will support this because we recognise that this money going into local government is important. It's a step in the right, the right direction. But actually what we've got to do is get rid of the SNP council tax and bring in something that will put local government on a fair financial footing moving forward. 
And I call on Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. If we defeat the Government today, Parliament takes the first step to bring an end to the Council tax. The Liberal Democrats will vote against the Government's amendment as it eviscerates Andy Whiteman's amendment, which we will support. We will oppose the Government's order. We are opposing the Government because we have a long track record of supporting true local democracy, because we favour the true reform of local taxation to a progressive land value tax and because we respect the work of the Local Government Commission on Taxation. If the Government wins, it will embed the Council tax, which the SNP have told us they hate but have done absolutely nothing about for a decade. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Minister will need to forgive me for being a bit sceptical about new promises now. This could be the only real chance this Parliament gets to vote on council tax reform. If the Government wins today, we will only get talks about talks about talks. If the Government wins today, it will undermine local democracy by imposing an unfair redistribution mechanism over the heads of councils. The more councils raise, the more they will be punished. If the Government wins today, it will be a message to carry on as normal. If the Scottish Government was serious about investing in our schools to get Scottish education back up the international rankings, it would back our plans to use a tax over which it already has control, to raise £500 million every year, five times as much, to transform our education system, the Government should put a penny on income tax, a modest penny on income tax. Yeah. That would be fair, progressive and moderate. It would be bizarre that the Government may even today vote against its own tax rise. So if we defeat the Government today, Parliament takes the first step to bring in an end to the Council tax. I would urge Parliament to take that step. Yeah, well said, sir. To wind up the debate, I first call on Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, one of the most impressive witnesses at the local government session, evidence session at the Commission on Local Tax Reform, was a councillor from the Scottish Borders. She told us that she wanted to go into the next election with a manifesto stating what her party proposed to do if elected. She wanted to tell her electors how much her proposals would cost and how she proposed that they be paid for. In other words, she wanted to do what most politicians in a representative democracy want to do. But today in Scotland, that ability has been eroded to the point where it is not really possible to make such an offer, since councils are today, in the words of Tom Johnson in relation to the borough, writing in relation to borough reform in 1832, mere miserable, starved caricatures of their former greatness. Derek Mackay uh, repeated assertions uh, he made on the radio this morning, seeking to justify the redistribution mechanism amongst of monies amongst councils by arguing that this was a well-established practice. It is not. It is a practice introduced by Mrs. Thatcher. It was introduced in the Rates Act of 1984 when non-domestic rates were removed from local control and centralized. The Act also introduced domestic rate capping, another proposal from the SNP, which no doubt Mr. Mackay would argue is traditional and well-established. Uh, Mr. Mackay made reference to the fact that we're on a journey. Uh, I look forward to that journey. Um, I hope we can all get on board the bus. I think that some parties will get off the bus a little bit sooner uh, than other parties. But I hope that when we do get on that bus, that everything comes on the bus with us and nothing should be off the table. Uh, and perhaps we should call the bus, the commission. Perhaps we should call, call. I'm happy to be on the bus with, with everybody in this chamber. Perhaps we should set up a, a, a bus called the Commission on Local Tax Reform. Presiding officer, at no time have Scottish Greens ever sought to block this legislation. We took great care not to do so in committee, and we are taking great care not to do so tonight. I commend my amendment to members. I now call on Derek Mackay to wind up the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Greens might think they're on a bus, but I would argue it's the Tories that are taking you for a ride, frankly. <laughs> and, and what they have done, and what, they, what you're proposing to do, 
is to remove progressive taxation as a fundamental principle to get the Conservatives on board only long enough for them to try and stop raising the council tax for higher value houses. Mr Whiteman is wrong. It is the case that there is redistribution within local government, and it wasn't just the Conservative, it isn't just the SNP. Such a regime existed under the Labour Liberal Executive for years as well. The principle remains the same. Every penny raised in council tax will stay with those councils. This SSI is just about the multipliers. The opposition can't even agree on what they appear to be uniting to agree upon. The Tories say it's about no change. The Liberals and the Labour Party think it's about some change. It's about raising the income tax rather than the council tax. And the Greens think it's about radical reform. Actually, this vote is about changing the multipliers, which is a reasonable, balanced approach that's in keeping with the mandate that the Scottish Government secured in the elections where we got, in an open and transparent way, the consent of the people to take forward our proposition, that also won the support of the Local Government Committee within the Scottish Parliament. Our reforms are more progressive, more progressive, not my words, but the words of the Resolution Foundation. They can be implemented as early as next April, so we can generate annually £100 million a year for our public services, for local authorities and targeting on education, something we have said that we would all agree around. 75% of council taxpayers, of course, paying no more as a consequence of our balanced reforms. Now, the opposition told us for long enough that the council tax freeze was unsustainable. We've brought forward a package of measures which will take forward sustainable increases to ensure that we generate more for public services in a progressive way. And I say to Parliament, we recognise our responsibility to taxpayers, to local authorities and, most importantly, to our young people. And we will see that additional funding delivered. And, most importantly, this party and this government will not let petty politics stand in the way. We will not. We will not. We will not let party politics stand in the way of doing the right thing for Scotland's children and taxpayers across this country. That concludes our debate on the council tax. The decision will be taken at so the question will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 2302 on committee membership. Formally moved. Thank you. The question will be put at decision time, to which we now come. And there are seven questions uh, today. The first question is that amendment 2281.2 in the name of Jamie Green, which seeks to amend motion number 2281 in the name of Fergus Ewing on realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that amendment 2281.3 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that motion 2281 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended on realising Scotland's full potential in a digital world be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next question is that amendment 2121.1.1 in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend amendment number 2121.1 in the name of Andy Whiteman on the approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. Yes. 
sorry, that is in, in this case, because there's some doubt about whether this vote has been carried out correctly, that yeah. is a point of order, Thank and you. I will rerun this vote. Thank you. And can I ask uh, Liz Smith perhaps just to move to another seat rather than express any doubt about that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are we okay to run you on this question? If members are okay, we're going to rerun that vote. The vote is that uh, the amendment in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend the amendment in the name of Andy Whiteman, be agreed. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 2121.1.1 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes, 63, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 2121.1 in the name of Andy Whiteman, which seeks to amend the motion number 2121 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. We shall move to division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 2121.1 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 64, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next, the next question is that Motion 2121 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, as amended, on the approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Parliament moved our vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 2121 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, as amended, is yes, 92, no, 35. There were no abstentions. The motion, as amended, is therefore agreed. The final question is that, in the name of, is that motion 2302 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That concludes decision time. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you.